This episode is sponsored by Atomic Mass Games. Episode 30 of the Board Game Geek Podcast, where we geek out about board games, the mechanisms behind them, and the people who create them. I'm your host, Candace Harris, and I'm super excited to be here today with Justin Bell, who's a board game reviewer for Meeple Mountain. How's it going, Justin? So good. It's so good. <laughs> I love hearing that. I'm actually just really excited to be here. I feel like you have the greatest job in the board <laughs> game industry, and so to be a <laughs> guest you. on this podcast is... It's maybe the highlight of my year. So this, this oh, is Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm so glad to have you here too. You know, uh so Justin and I met about a little over a year ago at Essen yeah. last year through mm-hmm. Beth, our our very own Beth Hiley. Um, because you play with Beth and John pretty one of my regularly. favorite gaming groups, yeah. And and I mean, she didn't talk about it that much. She has like maybe a thousand, I'm sure it's more than that, like eleven, twelve hundred games. <laughs> In their collection. <laughs> Amazing. It's like a library, like an yeah. actual library of games. And yeah. uh, it's a fun group to be part of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that game room, I know their their game room is pretty dope. Dope. <laughs> dope. <laughs> it is nice. But yeah, it was so funny when we, I think like, I don't remember what the first point was where we bumped into each other at Spiel. But again, it's like, there's so many, there were so many people there. And then I I think you might have been the person I bumped into the most. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and I was running from meeting to meeting too. That's that's the part that, at least at my first spiel last year, I I got wrong a lot. Right, like you're trying to do meetings in one big hall, and then you have to run like two football fields to get to your (laughs) next meeting. So I I learned a lot of lessons. I think I saw you a lot along the way. So yeah, it was good. Yeah, run. I was running to meetings also. But I'm sure I'm sure you brought home a bunch of games from Spiel, um, as did I, and I've been trying to play as many of them as I can, so I can kind of be on top of just not letting my shelf of opportunity grow out even more out of control. Opportunity, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I've also been to since Spiel. I've been to two historical gaming conventions. Ooh. I was at GMT's. Weekend at the Warehouse event, yes, uh, which is like oh, always so awesome and just like positive and chill. Uh, so I really enjoyed that. And then I also went to just last weekend for the very first time. Um, I attended SD Histcon in person, which was really cool because I've been a part of a few of their online events. Um, okay. I'm a part of the the advisory board for uh, for SD Histcon and just trying to. You know, they're very, they're very motivated and driven to kind of diversify that niche within a niche of like people who are playing historical board games and war games and everything. So, um, yeah, so I, I love being a part of it and it was like so cool going to there in person. I mean, there were so many designers there. Uh, Matthias Kramer came out from Germany. Um, Cole and Drew Worley were there. Uh, lots of content creators like Liz Davison from Beyond Solitaire, okay. uh, Dan Thoreau from Space Biff. That was a highlight. Uh, Guys kind of, yeah. yeah, yeah. But like lots, lots of different designers. I think there were just about 120 people there, and we were in. Oh, I'm gonna forget the name of it. Point something in San Diego. Okay. And, and the weather was just beautiful. The <laughs> vibes were great. Uh, the games were amazing. It was a lovely time. But anyway, because we both, like, you know, just got back from Essen, we have all these games. I went to these two historical gaming conventions. Today, we're going to do an extended Fresh Plays episode yes. and just kind of talk about all these games we've been playing. Well, not all of them, but some of them. <laughs> and I know, did you tell me you were like, you've reviewed like something like 20 games in the past month? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's interesting, right? Like last year, I wrote about 140 reviews. Wow. And a lot of those games came from the haul that I picked up last year uh, at Spiel. And so this year, I picked up, you know, it, I don't think it was crazy, maybe 50 games or so. But yeah, I've already worked through 
maybe 20 of them. I, I, I keep calling this like games season because, <laughs> and you're probably like this too, right? You come back from spiel and everyone's like, oh, let's check out that hall, baby. Yeah. And so they yeah. want, they want, <laughs> they want to see all the games you've brought back. Yeah. So in, in Chicago where I'm based, it can be hard to find players in the summer months to go do things. But I mean, right around October, you name it, 10th, 11th, 12th, you come back from this trip. People are like, saw Let's you landed game. a couple hours ago. Let's game. When can you get to my house? <laughs> <laughs> so we can play some games. So it's been really easy over the last three or four weeks to get everything to the table, which has been been a blast. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm really pumped to hear about which games you've been kind of like finding interesting and which ones you've played. Uh, because I don't know that we I'm sure we had some like overlap in what we brought back and what we were yeah. excited about, but I don't, you know, no, I'm sure we, we haven't played the same things exactly. So, mm-hmm. hey, hey, let's jump into our extended fresh plays. All right, you want to kick things off with your first game? Oh, by the so. way, we're, we're going to each talk about Six games. Six games. Okay. We narrowed down to six. That was yeah. tough. And that wasn't easy, right? I mean, it was there, not there were easy. a lot of games that, that um, and you're right, I ran into you a few times and we talked about this, right? It, it's, it's so hard to prioritize what games you want to table when you first get back from Spiel. Um, yeah. And in our space, we get lucky, right? Because there are some games like the White Castle and a few others that we got to try out and review before the show happened, right? So um, I think that was... That made things a lot easier. But so, so my number six, um, was the game that, uh, I, I really was fired up to see in part because I'm a huge fan of Czech games edition. And I'll be honest, I thought last year's slate was a little bumpy between Starship mm-hmm. Captains and Deal with the Devil. Um, so I was excited to see what was coming this year. And over my last couple of shows, meeting with their team, Kutna Hora, the city of silver, uh, was a game yeah. I had just a lot of excitement for. I know you talked about this on the last episode. Um, so with Elizabeth, and I think that um, there are a lot of things I heard you talk about that resonated with me, but um, the, the overview, essentially, this was a review copy provided by the publisher. Um, it plays um, really two to four players. I think where I would start with this game is this is the four player game that uh, to me is the one you should table soon. If you're going to get a full player count going, four players for sure. I tried it at two and three players, and I can already tell that the competition, some of this you hinted at in, in your discussion, yeah, yeah, it's just better at four players. So, so the overview of this game is, it's set in the, I believe the 13 and 1400s, um, Czech Republic, now Czech Republic, but it's a real life town called Kutnahora. It is about 30 miles outside of Prague. And um, over the course of five or six rounds, depending on the player count, you are tasked with essentially building this town, right? And right. Uh, establishing industry and, and uh, guild work. And um, you've got, you've got some of those like very euro things around area control and some hand management with a really small hand of six cards. But the way these mechanisms come together, I was really impressed with how approachable it is, right? Like, I think that it's a super dry cover. You're looking at this and you're like, man, this looks, this is going to be pretty bad. It's going to be pretty boring. <laughs> but then you get in there and it just does the things that I think CGA does as well as almost any publisher that I do work with regularly. Excellent player aids, very approachable gameplay, snappy, right? I think that, that my games were, were usually about two hours. The, the board, and you called this out in your discussion, it's, it's a really kind of bland, it's like a black and white, almost monochrome board mm-hmm. brought to life with very colorful pieces. There's this material they use called rewood, I think is, is the material, right? It's like right, a, right. a newly sustainable like replacement for wooden uh, products with, with your games. And I thought those felt really good in the hand. But um, so as a production, right, save for that cover. It really pops off the table. Right. right. And it's got a, a bit of market manipulation tied to a, a series of boards that track the value of things in the course of the game. 
So resources are never actually traded, but everything has a value. And so if you make it, you just make that much money, right? And, and you don't have to like move a bunch of wooden pieces or, or metal or food or beer, whatever the, the various resources are in the game. So I really love the way everything came together with this game. It's probably my only concern with it longer term, it's its variability, right? There's four different mm-hmm. milestones in the game, but there's no options for anything else. Um, the board is the board, right? So at the player count that you go at, it's always going to look the same. The same buildings are always in play. So there's, there's some of that. In that way, I really thought that CG nailed it by um, giving us a game of the now, right? Like right. a lot of people I know play a game three, four times, they move on. Um, for those three, four, five plays, Kutno Horror is going to be great. And it just, it does a really interesting job of, of conveying a, a city building experience in a compact way. So Kutno Horror is my number six. I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, that review hits for us very soon. So when this episode goes up, it'll be on our site. But cool. I'm um, just really impressed once again. And, and this feels a little bit like a market correction for the games from last year. I love that they took a big swing with Deal with the Devil. I know some people that love it, some people that did not love it. But I love that they tried it. Right. <laughs> this uh, Kutno Horror feels like, let's go ahead and get back to just really strong, solid basics. It's a solid game. It does the job. It may not be an all-timer, but it's it's just a really enjoyable play. Yeah, and I I completely agree. And so I have a couple comments here. Like one is, you were talking about how it's like easy to get into. Like that's how I feel like I describe it every time I'm I'm yeah. like it feels so smooth. Yes. Like it's just very intuitive. Like once you learn those actions it's like, "Oh, it makes sense. I plot. I need the rights. I need to build it there." Right. But what I love about it and I guess where I'm not as concerned yet about the uh variability is I've played it 5 times now. I actually brought five it to Five times. <laughs> I've actually brought it to um, SD HistCon because okay. it's a historically based game. And we, I mean, they people were playing on Mars there. So it's not like everybody's <laughs> just playing historical games. But sure. I still is like this is a, a different economic Euro game that's historically based. Uh, so I taught it to some people there. I was hoping to play a four player game, but one person mm. um, had to bail like right after the teach so uh, so i've actually (laughs) played it mostly yeah i've actually played it mostly with three players and um just once with four players and i was i i really i agree with you i think the four player game is gonna be like where it's like where it really like sings but i don't mind like the three player game they most of the games have been really exciting and i think what i like Number one, I think they can easily come out with an expansion for like more scoring for objectives, sure. and mm-hmm. I think they should. Yeah. Um, but uh, but also, I feel like every game just even though you have those you know, same buildings, they come out in different orders and everything. But like the way, depending on which guild you have and the order players do things, like it's so interactive that it still has been you know feeling very fresh to me and exciting hmm. every time I play. Like that's why I feel like I'm like happy to like teach people and play it more and more because it's like it's that smoothness and it's that like oh one game people went hardcore mining another game everybody's like doing you know more of the city building yeah some games you're rushing the cathedral stuff you know like and and depending on which patricians are put up like people do things differently so in that way i haven't been um bored with it but i definitely could see what you said like i think they're will need to be it will be nice to have some um you know at a minimum new milestones i think there are other little things you could do to expand upon what's there uh but yeah so far i've been like really really digging it myself and again like the the way that the players are driving the economy and the like the supply and demand and how that can change so much every day. Yes. Uh, every day, every game. And then also in the last three player game I played, um, I was playing and uh, I had this whole plan. I'm like waiting for my turn to come back. I'm like, okay, I'm going to plot there. I'm going to get rights to that building. Mm-hmm. And then eventually I'm going to build it there. And another player was like, 
She went to go plot somewhere else. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm ready to take my turn. Then she changed her mind and no. plotted right where I, I was like, oh, no. <laughs> she snaked you. No. Yeah. Yeah. So I love, I love that, like that fun interaction. And uh, yeah, it's, it's cool. It's, it's really, it's really solid and definitely worth trying if you like, you know, medium to heavy Euro games, I would say. Yeah. No, I, I think, I think very solid. I'm with you. It, each time I finish, I'm like, can't wait for the expansion content. I think it's gonna gonna give it some more legs. So yeah, give it so a look. That is Kutna Hora, the city of silver. So I also was curious, Justin. I meant to ask this earlier. Like, are your games in order of like how excited you are by them? Like in reverse order? Like that's a good question. You know, I think I think with all of these, um, I recommend them all. But I think that maybe I'll go with. My number one was the biggest surprise in terms ah, of how much I enjoyed it. Like this one, I thought was going to be good. It was good, but I still want to make sure cool. people get out there and, and play it. But as we get closer to number one, I'll, I think I'll be more in that place of, I had no idea this would be so great. What the? So, <laughs> so that's coming. Cool, cool. So I, uh, I put my list in order from, um, oldest to freshest. <laughs> ah, okay. So okay. so like in the time that like how recently I've played them. I'm pretty sure I think that's the order here. <laughs> um so the, my number 6 game is Rebel Princess hmm. uh which is a, another 2023 SN release or spiel release um designed by uh Daniel Byrne, Jose Gerardo Guerrero, Kevin Pelez. Uh, Tirso Virgo, Tirso Vir Virgos, Tirso Virgos, and it's published by Zombie Paella. Uh, this is a hmm. three to six player trick taking game where players are basically taking on the role of fairy tale princesses, celebrating this long five day party, and you're trying to avoid marriage proposals. <laughs> <laughs> so you're trying to, like, that's why you're a rebel princess. You're trying to. Stay single, and uh, hopefully all the other princesses get married. <laughs> um, That's wild. And yeah, they, they have so they have. I want to say like twelve different. I'm just guessing here. Twelve different princess cards, and they all have a special ability. Like there's a Little Mermaid, there's Snow White, there's Mulan is in there, mm -hmm. um, and each one has its own ability. Like one of them has an ability that um, before before you start a trick, you can tell the lead player what suit to play. And if they have that suit, they have to play that suit kind of uh, thing. Okay. So there are all these like once per hand rat slash round uh, abilities you can trigger. There are four suits in the deck. I think it's pets, queens, fairies, and princes. And... As you can guess, in a game where you're a rebel princess and you're avoiding marriage proposals, the princes are bad. You want to avoid winning tricks oh, with boy. princes. Yeah. Go. So each prince card has this like little like I think it's like a little skull and crossbone icon on it. Like <laughs> it's harsh. The, yeah. Yeah. So you're trying to avoid prince cards. Meanwhile, in the pet suit, there's a frog, which is a a prince undercover kind of thing. <laughs> And it's like the worst one because there are five of those skull and crossbones on that card. So if, if you win the trick with the frog, that is five proposals you just got. Whereas like all the prince cards only have like one proposal on okay. them. Yeah. So uh, the other thing is a, it's a like standard trick taking game aside from this other wacky stuff I'll tell you about. Like the, you know, princesses having abilities and everything. But it's like a standard trick taking game in that somebody's going to lead with a suit uh, you must follow if you have it. Otherwise you can play whatever you want. And uh, when you win the trick, you just collect the cards, put them face down. And then we count the princes at the end or the amount of proposals you have. And you're trying to have as little as possible. Um, and you play five rounds. So each round, because remember this is a five day party that we are, uh, where all these princesses are at. It's a big party. So yeah. um, each round, there's a round bonus card or not a round bonus card, but like a a round card that changes the rules for that okay. round. So this is sort of a this this trick taking game has been described by some people I've played with as a little wacky, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it it is very fun. So at the beginning of the game, you can either pick the round cards that you play with. I think there's a deck of like almost twenty of these different round wow. like rule breaking cards. But uh, I and the you only way see I've been, five of them in any one game. 
Yes. Okay. So, so again, you can choose if you want, but I do, I think what they recommend um, is just shuffle them and randomly you put them face down. So you only reveal one at a time, like it's mm-hmm. round one. Let's see what's going on. And each card will have a certain amount of cards that you'll pass and a direction. So, okay, maybe this round we're passing two cards to the left. Maybe next round we're passing three cards to the right. But it also will have some kind of like little thematic part of the story, but it's a a rule breaker. So, for example, the one I can think of offhand is before you start actually playing tricks, you're going to take your hand of cards after you pass to the left or right or whatever. You're going to take your hand of cards and divide it into two piles. You're going to play the first half of the round with just the one pile. And then Mm. the second pile, you're going to pass to the player on your right Mm -hmm. and then play the second half. And there's another card like that where you don't pass. You play both hands, but it's just that you're dividing your hand. So what's that mean? Like a lot of people are going to be like probably short suited on things. So it could be like, you know, a, a little bit wild. And like, what is the timing of? How many uh, pet suits you put in? Because you don't want to win that that frog card. No, no, no. So <laughs> oh, no, it's like there are no. all these like considerations, and it's just I love trick avoidance games, and it's just so fun to like you're like sweating trying not to get that frog card. You know, I, I don't mind taking a prince or two. I don't want to, but like if I have to, that's way better than getting stuck with the frog because also everybody will laugh at you. when you, uh-huh. Whenever somebody wins the frog, it's like, oh, you know. <laughs> so anyway, it, this is definitely a wacky game. I played it, the first time I played it was with six players um, mm-hmm. and then I played it with three and then I've played it with four. So I've played it three times. I have, I have actually enjoyed all three player counts. Okay. I definitely will say it's a little more chaotic with six, but it's yeah. fun, you know. So if you, if you like that kind of like a little bit of chaos and fun, like it was super cool. Like we wanted to play it, you know. The people who play that six player game, most of them were like, "Oh, I want to play this again. Let's play Rebel Prince." Definitely again. prefer chaos, and it sounds like I think I'd want to try this at six the first yeah. time around. Are the rules any different, or is it just? I don't just think. I think you take out some cards, maybe. Uh, for the, you know, dip- yeah, you do. You take out some cards because I think the cards can go to maybe 12 or something. So like maybe in a three player game, you take out the 12, the 11 and so, you know, okay. something like that. But otherwise the rules are the same. Everybody has like their princess and, uh, and with the princesses, I think we've been mostly just doing random. Um, but I think the rules say you like lay out all the princesses and everybody takes one. Or you can like give people two, let them choose, okay. whatever. But it's like the combination of the abilities of the princesses and the the round rules is really, really fun. How long does it play? Ah, uh, 45 minutes, you know? Like okay, a, so, like, so it's kind it's of like long a, it's for a five trick rounds. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's okay. five rounds. And I think each round you will play probably like eight cards. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Maybe you know, it, may, it might be ten. If that it might vary by player count. I don't know. Yeah, because I'm well. I'm trying to think. I think the the time where we split the hands, it might have been six and six. So somewhere between eight and twelve cards, and you know that's how many tricks you'll play each round. Sure. But yeah, it's it's about like a forty five minute probably. Yeah, I would say forty five minute trick taking game. I mean, the, the trick takers are just um, a friend of mine here in Chicago. He jokes. I think it's called the. He calls it the trick connaissance, maybe. The, the, yeah. I mean, it just feels like these games are <laughs> Renaissance right of now. trick taking games. Yes, yeah. it's, it's crazy. Um, but the usually the production of these games is what draws me in. Uh, how like the card art? Tell me more about like the look and feel. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. the The card art is really solid. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to. It's it's kind of like cartoony because right, they're not. Uh, they're not Disney princesses. These are. <laughs> uh, so you know they're kind of spin-off versions okay. like li- little mermaid is not going to look like ariel but she's a mermaid you know okay <laughs> um but it's kind of like playful not too not like kitty looking um i'm tr- and i'm trying to remember in this one if if there is i think all of the art for a suit might be the same hmm Wait, so this, Which, wait, different artists that, that do each suit? Is it like that? that oh, no, amazing, no, 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 right? no. 
I don't know that that's true. I don't know that that's true, but I'm just thinking like, I think if I recall, like every fairy card has the same like fairy image on it. Oh, okay. Yeah. But wait, that can't be true because they're different pets and only one is the frog. So ignore everything I'm saying, (laughs) but I I like the art. I like the art. I ended up um, sleeving the cards on this one just because um, it's, I don't know how easy it is to get and uh, I see it. It's it's something that's going to get a lot of play. Just for the listeners to know, because because we're on camera with each other, right as we're recording, is I react violently to the term "I sleeve the cards." I, I am not a card <laughs> sleever, so uh, just for the record, for the record, the yeah, set the record straight. Mm-hmm. I'm a fifty fifty sleever. Okay, it depends on okay. how the cards feel. Sometimes I'm like I have to like all of the uh, the Great Western Trail cards are like too thin feeling. So I like to sleeve them. Meanwhile, on the other end of the spectrum, there's like GMT's games. Most of them have these like really thick cards that sure. are that are like almost hard to shuffle till you like break them in a little bit. But they're <laughs> the like really, yeah. yeah. But I but I like it. Like it's just like wow, these are high quality cards, you know. Mm. And then I was uh, talking about Evenfall a couple of weeks ago. Yep. Um, they did that thing with cards that are they kind of feel like they have this matte finish, mm-hmm. and I did not like that texture at all. I found it like hard to shuffle and deal them and handle them. So I I had to sleeve those. Okay. So if you did you did you pick up Evenfall? You know, I haven't picked it up, but I've heard only great things from everyone. So I'm very curious to uh to give it a spin. Okay, well if you get it, I dare you not to sleeve it. <laughs> <laughs> I dare you. <laughs> Double dare. That's never gonna happen. I I categorically yeah. deny the use of sleeves. It, it's essentially my my copy of Voidfall is now open and ready to go, and uh-huh. I turned down the sleeves, and and I think that was still the right move. But I know others are going to come over here and be like, "Why? Why didn't you? Sleeve How this are you not wrong sleeving wrong this?" Wrong <laughs> <laughs> okay, so anyway, that was Rebel Princess. What's the next game on your list, Justin? Yeah. So uh, my next game and. I guess folks will have to look at the show notes for this because the name will be something that you won't even believe it when I when I when I tell you the name. But it's called Stega Gets Moomin, and even the Stega Gets word has a capital S at the front and the back of the word. It's it's when the folks from Ion um, Game Design handed me a copy of this game, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't tell if this was intentional or not. And and this is based on a I believe a 1950s or 60s comic or cartoon. Hmm. Um, so, so the backstory here is, of course, I, I'm excited to work with with Ion in part because I'm kind of a fan of their catalog from afar. And we At Maple Mountain, we've not worked with this publisher before. So cool. uh, first, a big shout out to, to Hannah from, from their team for giving us a chance to have a meeting um, in Germany a month ago. Um, and so I'm sitting there with John Manker. He's the creative director uh, uh, at Ion. And for those who don't know Ion, their catalog includes um, a couple of the PAX games, PAX Viking, PAX Renaissance, but also a game called High Frontier for All, the number four all, which if I'm not mistaken on BGG is still the most complex or heaviest game yeah. on, on their yeah. list. It's, it's got to be probably. If it's, if it's not, it's like number two. It's It's one or two. And so we're talking and he's like, hey, can I show you something? I was like, sure, man. I, I expected him to wake up, like whip out like High Frontier Five or, or something crazy, right? <laughs> and and he's like, I have this this family game called Stega Gets Moon. And of course, at, at that point, I'm I'm like I'm sweating. Like, what's what's happening right now? Where am I? Because <laughs> you guys made High Frontier, Pax Games, a bunch of other heavier stuff. And he was like, I just I want you to try this. So I got it home. Um, I have a couple kids, ages seven and nine, and so the look of the box told me this: we had something here, right? But let's okay. just let's see what it is. Okay. The 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 broader and, and John designed this game as well, so he's he's the creative design director there at Ion, but he also designed this game. So it is a two to six player, um, essentially a Yahtzee style uh, draw and write game for families, featuring the mm-hmm. characters from. The Moomin Valley, which is, I think, the name of the world. It looks a little bit like the Richard Scarry or Scarry. I can never remember how to pronounce his name correctly. Um, his world of cartoon characters, these characters look a little bit like 
the characters in Moomin Valley. Um, and it's just a very simple but elegant roll dice, keep the numbers that you want, match them with some of the characters that are drawn in this valley. The board is not a board. It's basically a roll of poster paper that has the world of huh. Moomin Valley drawn on it. And the back of each sheet, and I'm loving when, when when publishers do this, the back of each sheet is a different picture of Moomin characters that can be just colored in when the game's over. So oh, cool. do that when you want. That's fine. But during the game, it's a 20 to 30 minute play, uh-huh. chuck some dice, and um, y- you're coloring in characters that your dice match up with. The, the scoring system is, is really cute. The way the scoreboard is aligned with the outside border of each one of these sheets. And so each of the six players has their own area to draw and color in strawberries and, and keep score of what they'll be doing during the game. Um, a, a bit of set collection is essentially how the scoring system works, but um, perfect family weight game. Um, great production, simple, right? But great production. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have any feel for the world of Moomin Valley, right? But it, 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 I was surprised how well it drew my kids in. And, and whenever oh, I review cool. family games, it's always the same. If the kids finish a game of something and want to immediately play it again, five out of five. You know, it's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's a winner. <laughs> it's and um, so Stega gets Moomin worked for my family. And so I think it'll work for a lot of families. I can't tell how distribution is going to work with the game. You know, sometimes you, you I'm sure you can get it from the Ion website, but I'm not sure about brick and mortar or online retailers for getting a copy, but, but seek it out um, and take a look in the show notes for the name and uh, check out the art, art style. It's, it's good. It's really good. Nice. Nice. I, I, the, like this name sounds slightly familiar, but I can't um, picture it at all. And I don't, I don't, I didn't know much about it. That's, mm-hmm. that's cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, Maybe I think I remember they were starting to do some family weight stuff. Okay. Uh, Ion. Yeah. Um, Dawn on Titan is another one they have that's in that like uh, maybe older kid family weight territory. Yeah. But this one is definitely a, again, bring your seven-year-old, bring your 10-year-old parents. It, it fits a broad audience. And there's decent replayability in the way the system works with unlocking different characters that trigger an ongoing ability for the active game that you're in. So there, there's reason to keep going back to it. So, um, yeah. Very fun cool. Game. Stega gets moving. Stega gets moving. <laughs> uh, nice, nice. So, I, you know, I was talking about Rebel Princesses. Mm-hmm. You know, what's what's the next game that I played on my list? Now we're going to be talking about Witches. Because <laughs> <laughs> I played my first play of Septima. Oh, which, did you? Yeah, oh. yeah. I played Septima. This is a, a game uh, designed by Robin Hegedus, and it is a 2023 release from Mind Clash Games. Plays with one to four players. And Septima, I was like, this is, I try, like when I back things on Kickstarter, I usually just kind of forget about it. I'm like, okay, it'll show up. I know like there's some people that are like sitting around like, I can't wait till the show's up. Why are you late? You know, and I'm just like, I have so many games on my uh, like shelf of opportunity. That's not like a brag or anything. Like, trust me. But it's It's just like, I (laughs) it might be a curse. Exactly. Uh But I have like, I just, I can't even think about like sometimes that, even though I am excited in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, that's going to be, that's going to be good. But anyway, it finally showed up. And it is absolutely beautiful. Uh-huh. Um, like, it, this is another game, you know, we were talking about the kind of unique look of uh, Kutna Hora, but mm-hmm. this this board has a very unique look and feel. And I'll just, I'll just say up front, like, I think Mind Clash always crushes it with their production quality. No mm-hmm. Like, you know, the, between the art, the components. Um, in this game, you're going to be getting these, like, potions they made this like, uh, what do you call it? like the witch bowls? Like a um, like a cauldron like, kind of cauldron. thing? Cauldron, yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. there's a big like cauldron com- tray that you hold your the potion tokens in. Of and it's cool because if people yeah. need to see them, you can like pass it around. And it's also <laughs> great for storage in the game. Um, may not have been necessary, but it looks really cool. And it just, you know, it's just another like high quality like element and to my, my what gosh, they, they do. 
you're so right. Like Mind Clash is so good at, you, you probably don't need this, but here's this <laughs> thing anyway, right? Like, yeah. like there's always a little bit yeah. more than you need. And all on the game trays they include, and then they, yeah. they'll have like a rule sheet or sometimes booklet, depending on the game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that shows you how to like put all the trays back in the box, which is so helpful because, you know, there are some games you get that have trays or even if you like buy an insert, but sometimes if you don't know how to get everything back in, that can be frustrating. So I love that mm -hmm. they include a sheet that's like a little rule sheet of like you sack this on top of this, you put these tokens in here. Like that's all super cool. And it makes like punching those games so Ah, so satisfying, satisfying. No, yeah void, void fall, void fall. <laughs> void fall. Uh, yeah so it's so, so satisfying yeah so in septima uh you're basically each player is leading their own witch coven and you're striving to gain the most wisdom over four seasons and because you want to be the new septima or high witch hmm. and everybody starts the game you have your little, little player board you start the game with two witches in your coven and these witches, there are 24 of them, something. Yeah, there are 24 of them in the game and they all have their own little special ability. So I have my combination of two witches, you know, you'll have your combination and they each, each witch that I have has a different ability. So off the bat, like every game, you're probably going to have a different pair combination of witches that's going to make how you play feel differently. Do you, do you um, draft them or are they are they selected randomly? How do you randomly? Get? I'm pretty sure okay. it's, we did it randomly. I'm pretty sure you uh, you do randomly, but I, maybe there's a draft variant, or you you certainly could. But yeah, so you'll you'll get everybody will get two witches, and then um, you have like a leader pawn which you're gonna put on the board, and throughout the game you're gonna be like moving your witch leader pawn strategically or trying to <laughs> around the board to do a bunch of things like collect resources uh, and you got to position yourself to heal patients and you're also avoiding witch hunters that are around the board. So there's a whole uh, element to the game where you're the timing of where you move and how you're moving and being at the right place to do certain actions matters. But overall, like the gist is you are collecting resources. I think there were like five different types of resources mm -hmm. and you're spending resources to brew potions um, and then you're using those potions to heal patients um, because we're good. We're like really helpful witches or we're trying to like do good things in town. Right. And the different type, there are three different types of patients, blind, infected, and paralyzed. I don't think and, of witches like going out and healing patients or like, you know, well, hitting the local clinic. I don't, I don't think of that <laughs> as like, like standard is, witch it, activity. Hey, that is action. what is happening. That is what is happening. And some of the potions you can make in the game um, are just specifically to help heal those three different types of patients. Like there's one to help the blind patients, one to help the infected, one type of potion to help the paralyzed. But there are also like I think three or four other potions that you can brew with your uh, the different herbs you collect, the, the ingredients um, that have other abilities. So you can you know, decide which kind of potions you, you want and, and need for whatever your goals are. And the way the, the, the actions work in this game is you have cards. Again, this is similar to Kutna mm -hmm. Uh You're going to be playing cards to select what action you want to take. You have nine cards uh, representing the nine different actions in the game. And in this game, I think if you play like kind of the standard game, You'll play, ooh, I don't remember how many actions you'll play, actually. But I think you play a number of cards, and then at the end of the round, you get all your cards back. Right. So usually, like, when you play it, it sits on the table, can't take that action again, can't take that. There is one action called Remember that will let you play an action you already took. Okay. But we, we played our game with um, the modular expansion, the shape-shifting expansion, so in order for us to get our cards back, it's not just end of round, you automatically get your cards back. No, you have to choose when to shapeshift into one of your two animal choices. So I was playing orange. So I had a squirrel that I could shapeshift into and a fox. So, wow. so you, I would play, you play a card and that's going to say, you know, you're going to pick up all your cards and now I either become this fox or the squirrel. And this squirrel or the fox like has the same kind of tile 
that the witches are. So you'll cover up one of your witches with that. Okay. And, uh, and, and basically they have some kind of one of the actions where they can do it really like they have some special version of one of the core actions. But mm-hmm. the limitation is each animal can only play four different, I think four different action cards. So if I'm a fox, I might not be able to heal patients or, you know, okay. I don't remember exactly which actions are restricted on which animals, but there's some limitation there. Cause otherwise it'd be like, why would I ever change from being an animal <laughs> with this like <laughs> cool, powerful abilities? Right. But um, that's like mainly what you're doing in the game. Um, then when on the board, each space, like there are all these different spaces you're moving, like a point to point movement situation but they mm-hmm. some of them will have like a resource or two and so you're going to be like going out you know into the forest or the town deep into the town woods to to collect resources but there's a whole element of timing cuz the moon is shifting so as you play a round the moon is going to be shifting and wherever the moon token is, there's going to be a resource on either side of it on the round tracking, the round tracking area of the board. So you can only collect resources of the two resource types that are uh, adjacent to the moon. Okay. So you have to think in advance, like, mm-hmm. hey, if I'm going to try to get resources next round, I need to make sure my witch is positioned to be able to hit this space so that I could get as many of those resources as possible. Because yeah. I think before you take your action, you always can do one like quick move with your witch. But otherwise, to do like more movement, you have to actually play the move card, which you only have okay. one of those. So, mm-hmm. you know, aside from doing... So there's there's a whole thing of like timing in this game, of like being in the right place. To like to heal certain patients, you need to now move to like there's a hospital area of the center of the board And that's where you need to be. And there are different types of patients. So you need to position yourself adjacent to one of those patients to heal them. And some of the patients, like there's a central like hospital of patients you can always kind of heal, but you don't get to get a bonus. So I'll Mm. explain what that means in a second. But basically, there are a limited amount of patients on the board that if you get there first, you will take that off of the board. Like anybody can trigger that patient in the same round. But at the end of the round, if anybody healed that patient, that t- that token's going away. And like I said, you can always heal patients, uh, like spend potions to heal patients that are just like in the hospital. Okay. But the difference is on your player board, you have a track where you keep track of how many patients of each type you've healed. It's just literally a track, a vertical track. You move up these columns. So, okay, I, I cured a um, a blind person, so I move my blind token up. So when you move it up on a space, you get a little reward based on what you cover. So when you heal the the patients at the hospital, the ones that aren't like tokens on the board, Mm -hmm. you don't get to get the bonus. You don't get the reward of the space Uh, you're moving to, but you still get credit for like healing. And at the end of the game, this is a big source of your victory points, healing these patients, because if you get to the top of one track, it's worth 18 points. So the further up you go on a given track, you can get a lot of points. And that's a lot in that game. Like Yes. I think okay. I don't I'm trying to remember what our I'll have to <laughs> check what our end game scores were. But sure. yeah, but this is like the patient scoring seems like to be a good chunk of everybody's victory point scoring. I see. So you're trying to heal these patients, but there's also a variety a diversity scoring, right? So the more I have all of my every row that I have all of my um healing uh, patient healing tokens up on is worth six points so the more i move everything up i'm getting Mm -hmm. six points per row in addition to how high each track goes so it's one of those things where it's like you know you can't just i mean you can choose to just focus on going up uh because there are benefits to that but there are also lots of benefits to keeping them all built evenly love tracks gotta have those tracks (laughs) yep 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 and the folks at Mind Clash, I think they're sending a copy of this one because I'm I'm curious. And I've now, I think I've played all the games in the collection except for Perseverance. I've I played all the other ones. Is Septima a game that is because it's not a part of the Mind Clash play line, is it? Like no. in that weight class of of Astra. It right? is it's, right. No, 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 no. This is this is still a heavy game. 
Mm-hmm. So I feel like the theme makes it. Uh, I don't think it's as heavy as like Tricarion, right? Um, but I think yeah. it's like to me, it feels like like yeah, anachrony complexion or maybe less. Did you play yeah, okay. anachrony? Yeah, I have. Yep. Because I never feel like, and of course, I have a different uh, complexity tolerance than a lot of people. But I never sure. feel like anachrony is as complex as it like appears. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, oh, worker placement. Oh, you know, it's complex. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going like, to start playing with the time, right? And moving back yeah. and forth in time. And that yeah. actions are pretty straightforward. But I think that like I recall Tricarion felt he- like heavier to me and mm-hmm. Voidfall is heavier. But this is this is currently sitting on BGG, I think, at like a 3.58. Okay. So it's it's you know it's it's definitely medium plus like mm-hmm. so but I think where it feels like after especially after you play it once like it feels to me like a game because of the the theme everything is so thematic and mm-hmm. ties in well that it doesn't feel incredibly heavy to me but it definitely like there are some to play efficiently like i I was just like this game is hard so everybody has a secret objective also oh, there we go which has okay. like three things on it and i looked at my objective and this is just like what i was talking about i think i talked about trajan when i played trajan the for the first time a couple weeks ago and i was like oh i got my little secret scoring objective oh have two of these resources ah oh, that seems easy i'll just wait till the last round to do that and then it's like I didn't Uh-oh. even do it. I wasn't able to do it. <laughs> and this game, it was similar. Like I look at the card and I'm like, oh, like this seems easy. I need to like have my one type of patient marker up a certain way, you know, ha- do do X, Y, Z. But I was, it was extremely challenging because there's so many things you're like factoring in with the timing and everything. The other thing I didn't mention is every witch coven or player has a um, a suspicion track. So... There are going to be things that you're that you're going to do in the game. They're going to increase your suspicion level, and that's going to mean something. And each round that you increase suspicion on your end, you're going to possibly attract a witch hunter to you. There you're going go. to have to. Yep, yep. you're going to have there to roll it. You're going to have to roll a die and see how far they move in relation to you. And you might be in a different zone the way the board's kind of mapped out that it it won't matter. You'll be safe. But if you do get caught by a witch hunter, you have to lose one of your witches. So on your player board, you have slots for four witches. Okay. And, and you start, start with two. two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's say you lose one. Mm-hmm. That witch is going to be on trial. And I haven't talked to you. Yes. <laughs> wow. there, there's a trial. There's a trial. Yeah. 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 So there are a couple more things I'll tell you about this game. Um so yes, it's heavy. It's it's a little heavy. It doesn't seem it's like it. Clash, I think though. this, this yeah. feels on, oh yeah, on it's point totally it's game. thematic yeah, yeah. and heavy. Um, but I think people maybe will think it's lighter because it's like witch theme. Like oh, that sounds light. But no, it's 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 got some heaviness to it. Mm-hmm. But there's a whole thing where each round, um, when you play your card, everybody picks a, an action card simultaneously, face down, and then you do you simultaneously reveal in this game. Uh, I think that would so. add to the drama if if you had you. That, yes, right? you do. You do yeah. because here's why it's important. If you match icons, let's say you and I both chose move, and you can talk about this because there are advantages to doing this. You're going to uh, increase suspicion. So mm. because it's like, hey, we're witches. We're working together. You know, like we're attracting more attention to ourselves by combining forces. But the, Some of whom are like disguised as a bear or whatever. I mean, like you got <laughs> crazy stuff going on here. Yeah. Exactly. Right. But but the offset of it is there's this ritual track. This there's a whole separate board that's a ritual track that if we match and our ritual marker can advance up and hit the icon of the action that we played, you get some bonus. You can get these spell cards, which are cool. And then to play a spell card again, you have to do this thing where you match. Um, either other players or the Septima, the High Witch, she always has a an icon that you can synergize with. Okay. But but when you match, you're getting some perk, but you're also increasing your suspicion. So so that's like something you gotta factor in. So yeah. like I said, every round there's a trial. So after we do all our actions, there's a trial, and 
you are going to basically like there's always a default witch just drawn from the pile um, on trial. So you're going to like put a certain amount of these red meeples, they're angry citizens of the town. You are kidding me. Into oh, a my bag goodness. based on our suspicion level. So if we all have low suspicion, not too many of the red meeples go into the bag. But <laughs> if we do, there will be a lot. And they're like, there's an action called like recruit where you can kind of put your loyal citizens in to offset the negative ones. Yeah. And then basically you are drawing, then somebody's going to draw them around all in the, the court. Like there are these seats in the court. And if the players have more of their player color meeples than the angry citizens, then the player who had the most of their meeples drawn out gets to keep that witch. So that's how you're going to add more witches to your board. And wow. remember I told you you have a goal card? Sure. So your goal card, I think, has four scoring objectives. The amount of scoring objectives you can actually score depends on the amount of witches you have. There it is. So, there it is. Right. yeah. So at the end of the game, I I beat someone's score uh, because I denied them of getting a third witch. So they couldn't score a third objective. Mm -hmm. So there's something there. But anyway, yes, you, as you it's can see, there. there's a lot. There's a lot going on. This is not like a, a light game by any means, but I think it's very thematic and like really like everything you do is intuitive so even if you're someone who doesn't play a lot of heavy games but you're intrigued by this theme i would say give it a go because yeah. i think once you start playing it doesn't feel like everything feels them thematic like oh i'm putting somebody in here for the trial and you know this you know the witch hunters we're attracting them because we're combining forces to do stuff you know i'm healing i'm collecting resources i'm healing patients and making potions and then, you know, so it's like at a high level, what you're doing is just like makes thematic sense. And I think that makes the heaviness kind of water sit down a little bit. So maybe as a hot take, because this is your first play recently or you've done multiple first play, play just one. Um, where does this one land from a first play perspective against other mind clash games as a first play? I really like this game. Yeah. So I'm here. Um, yeah, I, I really liked it. I want to play it more Yeah. to kind of, you know, you need to play these games more, How but much? I really liked it. I'm trying to mm. think. So I still think like, I love Cerebria so much. Mm -hmm. Um, I, because that one's just like a little more different, but I'm, I'd be more excited to play this. If you ask me right now, than like anachrony. Okay. Um, I haven't played Tricarion in a while, so I don't know that that is the case, but I just think like for me, like a unique theme and like having the theme, like come through the gameplay mechanisms and just like the look and feel of this game. Uh, I think it's really neat. And also yeah. it's a game where I'm like, ah, like a lot of the game, like Arborea and, um, there's some, uh, oh, another game I'll talk about later. But, um, I like games that like where you play and you're like, I want to get better at this. I know I can get better at this. Like there's a, yeah. there's a skill to it. And you play that first game. You're like, okay, I can be more efficient now that I understand the flow of things, but it's still like taxing on your brain. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's hard to say like, you know, I, I like Voidfall quite a bit, but it, Voidfall is very intimidating to think about. It's like a project, you know, it's, it's huge setup time, takes a long time to play. Whereas like Septima is a weekday game easily. Weekday you know. game. Love yeah, that. yeah. Yeah. It's a weekday game, you know, and it's like it can get to the table more. The theme is going to be um, more appealing to a lot of people I know. Like I, I there were a lot of people who were just like, oh, a, a witch coven game. Yes. Yes. I want to play that. Like people who don't play a lot of games, but that excites them. So I like it a lot. I'm just going to say that. I like it a lot so far. <laughs> um, I want to play it more. But uh, I think it's really, really well done. Good. Yeah. I'm excited to try you that. I yeah. Think, uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts when you get to try it. Mm hmm Because you, you were a backer, right? Yes. So, so this one just arrived for you in the last week or two? Yeah. I yeah. think other so super people, fresh. Yeah. Super fresh. Super fresh. I mean, you've got fresh. even fresher stuff coming in the next couple of picks. And this is good. It was, it was Halloween weekend I got it, which was like perfect timing. That's <laughs> yeah, that is. But yeah, okay. that is – that's Septima. Septima. Okay. Um, so my number four, um, is interesting because I'm pretty sure I got this from you. 
<laughs> is um, nice. you talked about this either here or Game Brain or, or somewhere else. And um, I was like, I need to try that because it sounds like she knows. I, I There's something about this one I think I'm going to like. Um, and then, of course, Fates once again struck because we sat together at a demo for this uh, at Gen Con. Right. Uh, back in August. So I think it's pronounced Zhangguo, the first empire. Yeah. This is a um, – I'm going to say an updated version, right? It's not a complete – it's not a straight reprint. It is right. a we, – we've, we've brought this back to the world and then we've made some changes. Um, and I think the original Zhangguo – uh, came out in 2014 or 15, maybe 2016. It's it's not that old, right? It's like eight to ten years old. This one was designed by Marco Canetta and Stefania Nicolini, and the re-release of this game came out. Um, I guess officially it came out at Spiel, um, and was published through the Hachette Group through through Sorry We Are French, and um, I think the overview here is this is a 30 turn. Um, highly, it's interesting. It's a strategy game, but there's so much around the tactical play of the cards with this game um, that mm-hmm. makes it really mm-hmm. interesting. This review um, is up on the Meeple Mountain website. It went up not long ago, but I've played this now um, solo um, at three players and at four players. And I've played the original Zhang Guo once because I wanted to see, I wanted to compare the two. Um, and I'll start with the production here. The production is, is magic. It is, it is a beautiful production. Yeah. Um, everything about it, right? They yeah, nailed it. It's gorgeous. Yeah. And, and I'm trying to think if I've ever had a Sorry We Are French game. And by the way, Sorry We Are French is one of the great publisher names in our industry. Uh, it is, <laughs> it's just, it's just so funny. Oh, so, sorry. We, we are French. I, I, I didn't know what to. So, so the, the, these guys also did, um, the Iki. They did the new Iki. Which yep, is the new just one for that, which yeah. is also gorgeous. They're bringing back uh, bangers. <laughs> bangers. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, now, now, here's what I'd say, though. And they also did Galileo Project, one of the underrated gems from 2022 in my mind. It was a great game. Very, very quick. I don't Euro. know it. I don't think I Yeah. Ga- okay. Galileo Project. I mentioned that because it was illustrated by the same folks that did the Zhang Guo reprint or oh, remake. Oh, okay. Um, David Sitbon. And um, I, so I played the original game first. And it's not – I don't think it was that great, if I'm being honest with you. Like, I thought really? it was okay. I, I thought, I've never actually played the original, so. Yeah. But, yeah. And, and the original suffers from the things that seem to all have been fixed in the new version, right? The the board is a mess. The wall system is also kind of messy. Um, there's a couple processes that have been updated and changed. Um, they've given actual names to the various officials that you need to do all the things in the game. Right. So, so this was, to me – um, one that I was excited about, mainly because of sorry, we are French, right? I think I think I was like, yeah, first game's okay. Let's see how this new one plays out, and it's good, but I think <laughs> that this is going to be a little bit like Mind Clash games, and I love that we just talked about Mind Clash coming into this one because um, a little bit like Voidfall as projects go, mm. you're going to want a Zhang Guo group. This is a pretty terrible. Let's just. Hey, let's sit down one night and just play one game of Zhang Guo and never go back to it again. I think it's a bad idea here. This is the kind of game you want to get two or three friends together and then play that game five to 10 times. If you do that, this is going to be one of the great games that you play this year. Um, so, so the game is essentially a hand management game that has a bunch of other things going on. I'll, I'll just, maybe I'll start with it's a hand management game. Um, as one of the guys in my review crew joked, there's probably four games here, three or four games. And how do you make all these games work over the course of your always exactly 30 turn setup? There's six turns in each of the five rounds. Each round, you get a hand of six cards that are numbered from one to 120. They're all uniquely numbered cards and incredibly well illustrated cards. The cards are on your turn, you're allowed to either tuck a card in your player board to essentially increase the capacity of bonuses that trigger on your board. Or you play the card to this center court area. And then based on the number of the previous card played into that, that court, you can do whatever you want with the card. You can take any one of the game's six main actions by playing any card in your hand. 
But the only way the bonuses trigger is if you do a certain action and then play it as a number higher or lower than whatever number is out there. And that leads to <laughs> one of the things I love about games, right? This is actually why I love games like Brass or my number one for this year so far, which is Hegemony, um, is you're staring at your cards and each turn you're like, I can't do this. I just, <laughs> I, I can't do this. Like every turn, you're, you're, you're trying to find a way to trigger, like, trigger all those bonuses, but also do a thing that might close my good friend Candace out of being able to trigger bonuses on her turn. Right, right. Et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and so, so that part is a game. You've got like governor scoring that does air, some area control things. You've got some terracotta soldiers that trigger milestones. That's another game. There's a wall scoring system and to get there first, that multiplier gets you a bunch of points at the end of the game. Like there's, there's just, there's a bunch going on. Yeah. And you got to manage like unrest with the citizens in, in your various territories. It's doing the rules for this game is also why you're, you're going to want to find a group to play this with all the time. Cause a teach of this game is an hour in the wrong hands. That's probably the other, the other major downside for me was solo was really snappy. I think two players is probably, I didn't play it at two players, but probably a good look. Three players is probably where this game lives because four players, two of whom, even two of them, if they have a lot of, what we, we call it like, like, like analysis paralysis, right? If two of those folks have AP, you're dead. It's, it's a three, three and a half hour game. Cause you're, you're talking about 30 turns per player. <laughs> so yeah, 120 yeah. turns. So, so that might be enough for some of the listeners here to be like, yeah, you know what? I'm out. But, but I would say, I think that the, uh, the hand management and the card play in this game is why you check it out. And then while you're sitting there, you get to look at a gorgeous production. So, yeah. Um, recommended, but with the caveat that I think you really want to make sure you have a group that's willing to play it again a few times just to give it a, enough of a chance to really shine. Yeah, I I, I would agree with that because I know my first play of Zhang Wo First Empire. Um, my first play was very like, with, actually, we had. I think we had three new people and one person had played the previous version. Okay. And it was funny because um, <laughs> my friend who had played the previous version was like throughout the game, like, oh, I like this version better. Oh, I think I like the first version better. Oh, like he was having this thing. And even like days later, he was still trying to assess what he, and he's like, he's, I think he's, his last plan was to get the new version and maybe make some hybrid version of what he, because there's still like something he <laughs> like liked. Like house rule it to, yeah, to his satisfaction. Yeah, there, there, so, there was some aspect of it that he preferred in the re original game, but overall like the new game. And the new game adds that whole like, is it like the the river section yes. on the side? Yeah, because yeah. that wasn't in the first one. But and yeah. that could I, be divisive, I think, for a person that has seen the old game because yeah. this is a new, essentially a new mechanic. Right, mm -hmm. right. And so I... I ended up, I think when I played this, I played it back to back, like within a couple of days. So nice. I, Smart. but with different people, but for me, it was so much smoother that second play because of everything you just said, like there's a lot going on. There are all these like mini games and I feel like it's definitely a game where you want, you probably should just try to like focus on one thing a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise you could just get like lost, <laughs> get a bit lost, but I think it. Yeah, I, I agree. It's it's excellent. I think it will be more rewarding the more you play it, where you don't have to um, teach. Uh, I didn't find the teach to be that tedious uh, because I think, like you know, like you said, there's six main actions that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the harder part is like just figuring out what's the right thing to do because you do have all these ways you can score points and all these of implications of what cards you play and don't play and when you tuck cards and this, but, um, but I, I, I like it a lot. And the original publisher was uh what's your game uh, who okay. made Nippon, which I love and mm -hmm. also uh, Madeira. And I think they, I like Madeira. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think they're like that publishing company was just on to some really, really interesting Euro games uh, but that's why I'm so glad. Sorry, we are French, 
um, is like reviving some of these games. Like, oh, I love Iki. I love Iki. I, I think that Sorry We Are French is moving a little bit like Mind Clash for me into that territory of there's a game coming out. I'm, I'm automatically either interested in, in reviewing it or buying it or, or whatever it is. Like it's, it's, it's going to be quality. Um, so let's, let's check it out. So this yeah. is heavier than their other stuff. Totally. I think this is heavier yeah. than, than Iki and other games, but um, yeah. very good. I, I think, and I'm curious to know with the people that the person that you mentioned that had already played the old game in talking to a couple other people, this to me replaces the old game. I, I'd be very surprised if you had this version and the original Zhang Guo and then said, yeah, you know what? I'll keep both around. Right. Just, to me, the, the new one, there's, there's no need to have both. Right, right, right. Yeah. It's it's just there like there's so much more variability and everything. Yes. But yeah, it is this is like if you're into heavy Euro games, like this is very unique. And uh yeah, I dig it. Zhang. Give it a look. Whoa. And now a word from our sponsor. Marvel Crisis Protocol is a tabletop miniatures game that lets you assemble a team of heroes and villains drawn from across the Marvel Universe. Choose epic heroes like Captain America, Iron Man, or Black Widow, or recruit powerful villains like Ultro and Doc Ock. Mix and match your favorite characters to form your dream team and make them your own as you assemble and paint highly detailed miniatures. Whether you decide to paint your heroes and villains in their iconic comic book styles or follow your imagination, Marvel Crisis Protocol is your chance to build and create your own one-of-a-kind Marvel collection. Once you've assembled your team, it's up to you to lead your squad to victory by using each character's abilities to maximize your team's full potential. Join the fight today with Marvel Crisis Protocol, Earth's Mightiest Core Set, available now at a local game or hobby shop near you. Okay, so my next game, uh, now we're jumping into the past weekend at SD HisCon. Here we go. Um, I bought a game months ago, months ago, earlier this year, I think, yeah, called Land and Freedom, The Spanish Revolution and Civil War. And I just heard good things like I think David Thompson, uh, one of the designers of Undaunted Normandy yeah. and a bunch of awesome games. I think he was talking about it and was just like really digging it. And I was like, oh, okay, I got to get this game. Got to get this game. Got he was it. there at the convention, right? Yep. He was there too. Yeah. I'm surprised he had time to play any games because that guy, it seems like he's- <laughs> Always putting David. out games. Uh, that guy's yeah. always putting out games. Always That's putting crazy. out games. Yeah. Um, but, and, and actually I brought this cause I was talking to you, he messaged me, um, and was like, Oh, I'm looking forward to seeing you there. You know? And I, I, I mentioned land and freedom cause he loves it. And he's like, yeah, he's like the designer. Alex Knight is going to be there. We should all three play <laughs> as it worked out <laughs> or didn't for David. Uh, I ended up finding Alex when David wasn't around. And, um, <laughs> so I ended up playing like it, there was like just the right moment that I was with my friend Lauren who came from LA with me and uh also another game designer who was there um that I met uh, Natalia Wachtowix Wachtowix okay. oh, mm -hmm. I'm so sorry I'm not pronouncing her name right probably but she is a war game designer and an author of a book called War Gaming Experiences. She hmm. worked for NATO at some point and now Whoa. she teaches. Those, that's some street cred, man. Yeah, she teaches like war gaming design at Hague University. So she lives in the Netherlands now and uh, she's super cool. So she was, she flew out for SD HisCon. So I got to meet her and we hung out with her quite a bit. So the three of us were like sitting around like, oh, what should we play? And Alex was around. So I was like, Alex, could you teach us <laughs> your game, Land and Freedom? And he did. And of course, like, as we're mid-teach, David Thompson walks in the room and like, he's like, oh, he's like, <laughs> you dumped me, traitor, or something like that. <laughs> I don't remember. But I, I was just happy to be playing it. But here's the premise. Um, basically, the game is set in 1936. And at that time, there were right-wing army generals that like rebelled against the Spanish Republic. And they were getting help from Hitler and Mussolini. And in the game, this is a semi-cooperative game, mm -hmm. and we have to save Spain. So we are playing as three different factions. So this is a three-player game. Uh, it's a one to three-player game, but it's designed as a three-player game. But like they have some way you can play it with one or two. I see. Um, mm -hmm. But y you probably want to play it with three if you can. Uh, I don't know. I, mean, I would maybe try it. 
the two player mode, but we played it with three. So I was the anarchist. Uh, Larn was the communist and uh, Natalia was the moderates. And we basically have to kind of like put aside our differences and try to shut down fascism in Spain. And we're trying to like save Spain because if fascism gets out of control, we all lose the game. If we're able to, you know, keep things in check a bit, then only one player is going to win. And uh, the way victory works in this game is very unique because you have like we have each like a set of our own like little faction tokens. And throughout the game, the more you have the initiative, um, you're going to get to add your token in this bag. Um, It's a little sack, you know. Okay. And at the beginning of the game, we each put one of our faction tokens in there. But t- during the game, we're going to try to keep the initiative for our faction so that we can put another token in here and there and put a token, you know. So there are different things you do in the game that let you put these tokens in. And at the end of th- each year, so it's you play three years or three rounds, um, at the end of each year, you're going to pull a certain amount of tokens out of the bag and put them into the scoring area. So there's this area. So in year one, you're only going to pull one token out. In year two, you pull two. I see. Then there's this like cool final bid thing where we get to bid for a spot. So you'll put one there. And then at at the end of year three, you're going to pull five tokens out. And basically, whoever has the most of their tokens on the, in the scoring area is going to win, assuming we don't let fascism get out of control. <laughs> okay? So this there's game- that, I guess, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this game is a card-driven game. Think of Watergate. Twilight okay. Struggle, mm-hmm. if, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I know Watergate was very yes. popular. Uh, of course, Twilight Struggle also, but it, that's a heavier game. And I think Watergate hit a wider audience. But it's that kind of game where each player has their own deck of cards. So we have our own little faction deck of cards. And then we have five tracks on the main board. Tracks. That, yes, there where we we're going to be doing like a tug of war kind of thing um, through the cards we're playing and events we're triggering. Uh, again, similar to something like Watergate, you know, you're pushing and pulling on that 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 track there. Okay. Um, so there are five tracks, and each player cares about each faction cares about two tracks. So, like I, as the anarchist player, cared about liberty and collectivization, and they were fighting over government control. Um, but then also the communist player uh, wants to like boost up the Soviet support track. And then the moderates player wants to boost up the foreign aid track. So we're doing things throughout the game to push and pull on these these different tracks. But I mentioned you put one of your tokens in, which is how you're going to score based on having the initiative. So for me, I needed to have my uh, collectivization and liberty tracks up to a certain number. And if, if it was like high enough on both tracks, not just one, then I have the initiative. If I'm lacking on either one of those tracks or both of those tracks, then we're going to look at the government and see does do the common does the communist player have the government on their side or mm-hmm. the moderates, and then that's that player gets the initiative. So we're fighting over initiative, <laughs> but meanwhile, they're on the left side of the board. There's a map of Spain, and we have these different regions where you're going to be putting these uh, like fascism tokens. It's representing like armies or. Uh, I guess um, they're Not the like, spread like of fascism, it's like, like it's, a- it's like, yeah, it's like fasc- fascist attacks kind of, but they're just tokens. So we're just counting the number of tokens there and each turn. So each year you're going to be flipping four cards one at a time. So you flip a card and there's an event and it's going to tell you to put a certain amount of fascism tokens in an area. Okay. So maybe Madrid gets, we have to add five to Madrid. We have to add one in the North. So we're adding these tokens. For every token that's there on the gray side, that's a negative point for us. It's bad stuff for us. And on that same event card, there's going to be a test at the end of the round. So it'll say something like, you know, like maybe we put five tokens in Madrid. So if at the end of the round, if we're able to get Madrid to plus one, meaning we've cleared all those and we've added more anti-fascism tokens or whatever, then we get some good reward. Sometimes it'll okay. impact all of us. Sometimes it'll just impact one of us. But if we don't do that, then there's a negative effect. There so we we're all like, how much do you want to contribute to doing that? Like we should probably <laughs> take care of that. Because if at any point, any of the like four regions that are in the game have 
10 or more points uh, of fascism tokens, that is defeated. That area is defeated and it cannot be fixed. And if two okay. areas get defeated, we lose the game. Or yes. if we lose Madrid, we lose the game. So, so we have to each 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 time we play a card, you know, this is happening first. Hmm. So then, after we res uh, add the tokens from that event card, then each player um, will secretly select a card face down. And once again, <laughs> I think this one we just reveal on our turn. So in turn order, first person will say, yeah, okay. "Okay, this There's is the no, card like, I played." Big reveal, all yeah. Three at the same time. Got it. Yeah. So the whoever's whoever has the initiative will go first, and they'll decide. Um, if they want to play the card for whatever the event says, and when you play it for the event, you you remove it from the game, or you add it to your tableau. And this is something new. I've played a lot oh. of card-driven games, but this game, when you add a card to your tableau, you have like an action point value at the top. And you also, each card has a certain amount of these little icons that usually bump tracks, but they might have other effects. So on a future turn in the same round, if I add another card to my tableau, I can trigger all of the uh, one type of icon on these cards. Um, so you're doing this like engine building thing throughout the round, which is uh, really cool and clever for a card driven game. But okay. a lot of what you're doing is either taking care, like removing these uh, fascism tokens or mo moving these tracks up and down. And each of the tracks have other things like when it hits a certain level, maybe it bumps something else or there's some other kind of impact. So after we do that, like after everybody resolves a card, then we would flip another event, like put more tokens out, you know. Oh, you would re resolve the test also on each card. Say, oh, okay, okay, were we successful? Yeah. If so, do this. And then we do that again. And you play three rounds. Um, there are a couple other little things like there. You can get hero tokens throughout the game. And Heroes. on your turn. Yeah. Bingo. <laughs> yeah, you can get hero tokens. And these can be spent on your turn to do bonus actions uh, such as either getting another track bump if you're able to get a track you care about all the way to the you know positive side of that track you can get a medallion so there are these five i think medallions that are out that some of them are like an ongoing ability some of them are a one-time effect you can trash to uh do something and then um the other thing is oh yeah so then also on the board you have these morale and teamwork bonuses so that was really cool because at the beginning of the game one of them's turned off and that's another thing you could spend hero tokens uh, tokens on to turn it on so when you're doing that tableau building when i said you could trigger icons that match across mm -hmm. all the cards that you've played you can only do that if morale is turned on if morale mm -hmm. is off you can't get that bonus effect of chaining those cards so, I want those bonuses. I yeah, those bonuses. yeah, yeah. And teamwork bonuses reward people who help with dealing with fascism. You can get extra hero tokens and stuff. But um, it's really cool. You know, I love the heroes the, come from from real life events. I assume as well, like like you get the, real the, life characters that are brought in. The cards are all historical and have like flavor text on them. Yep. Yep. Um, based on like who they're talking about or what, you know, some kind of event. So it's all historically tied in, but the, the hero tokens are just little like cardboard tokens. They're not, mm. there are no pictures on them or anything like that. Uh, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> the, the history is going to be on the, the cards mainly that you're getting to play from your, your specific faction deck. But, um, yeah, it's, it's just like a really cool, like three way tug of war. Like you're always kind of suspicious of what one player might do. Sometimes you have to talk to one one of them like, oh, we can't let this other one do this. But then, you know, a couple turns later, I'm talking to the other person. I'm like, oh, we can't let her do that, you know. Right. So it's got like that really cool tension. And also I love the semi-cooperative nature. Like we have to do something about this. Mm -hmm. But we also like are concerned about our own, you know, we want the initiative for our faction. So you have that like that struggle that you're dealing with. And I'm sad to report that on the very last card flip, <laughs> fascism got out of control no. for our game and we all lost. <laughs> we all lost on the... And it was funny, like early in the game, we were helping, we're getting hero tokens and we're like, yeah, yeah. But it was like, it was almost like as we were like getting familiar with the game and getting a little selfish, things trickled and like started getting a right. little out of control. And right. then we flipped that last event card and it added six tokens in Aragon 
And that was it. It was like, we we failed. We have failed the people. Was there finger pointing at that point? Was there like, this is your fault? <laughs> I don't Lord, think so. what are you thinking? Like, <laughs> like did that happen? We, we kind the- of, we kind, there was no finger pointing. We were just kind of like, oh my goodness. Like, we, we all were just feeling a little guilty. <laughs> That's really but, funny. Uh, had a blast and um yeah I'm kind of I'm looking forward to playing this one more. So you, so you picked up a copy and so now you'll be able to like do the same thing at home and and, and try it out. I well I uh, I bought this month. months ago. So I just oh, I brought okay. my copy with me to SD Hiscon. Mm-hmm. And this is uh the publisher listed on the game is Blue Panther who they do like print and play games. Like I think Holland Spiel uses if you ever uh bought yep. a Holland Spiel yep. game, Blue Panthers who prints it like when you order it. So um, that's this game. So, you know, it has like a canvas kind of map to hmm. it. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's 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 a really cool game. I was like, we we had a blast and we we all wanted to play it again. Like almost the interaction sounds like it was good, too. I think I think oh, anything yeah. that forces people to just uh, you have to be talking now. You're going to have to work together. Sort yeah. of. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. And it's like it, it's about, I would say, like a 90 minute game. So it's oh, like that fast. Okay. It's, it, then, yeah, then exactly. It's yeah. longer than Watergate, something like Watergate, mm-hmm. but it's not that crazy. And actually it could go, it could go pretty fast, but if, but it's thinky too. So if you have people with uh, AP, they might be taking a while, like looking at all their card options, but like I, I usually play pretty fast. So I'm like, all right, let's go next, next. Okay. <laughs> but okay. yeah, so that game is land and freedom. A uh, three-player game from Love Alex it. Knight. I will check this out, and, and it's always fun to have. And this is the part that I, I stress to people that have not gone to conventions in the last couple of years, right? It's you know, I met I met David Thompson at a, at a show last year because he and I did a, did a podcast for the same another outlet. Oh, cool! Um, but but I think like this teach, I'm sure, or just being there with Alex, right? I'm sure that made it just significantly more interesting. Now you can't, yeah, you can't package was, him and bring him everywhere you go, I guess, but, right. but it's fun to have him around. Yeah. It was, it was so nice to have him like just there. And de- of course he was down to teach it. And, sure. uh, but I would also say like, don't be afraid to just pick this up. If any of that sounded interesting, because the rules are not that complex at all. Like I, mm. I feel like it's like a 10 page rule book and it's, it's, very clear and uh, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. But it was nice to have the teach from the designer. <laughs> I love that in our world, ten page rule books is is a short. It's yeah, a very, it's a very compact. <laughs> it's only ten pages. No, it's fine. <laughs> it's not the seventy four page uh, void fall compendium of. Uh, <laughs> that's one of five rule books, by the way. <laughs> anyway, what's your next game, Justin? Yeah, so number my three. number, my number three. Uh, for extended fresh plays was my number one game in terms of my excitement level for, for Spiel. That game is Nucleum. And uh, it is the kind of big piece of chicken release from Board and Dice this year. Um, no tea games this year, right? So, so this year <laughs> it's, uh, it's Nucleum designed by, uh, I don't know if it's David or David. Turksy. I'm always, I think he goes by David. Okay. Let's go with David. Um, he's the wild man you see walking around conventions in the, uh, you know, in the suit jacket. And, uh, he's usually, (laughs) he's, he's, he's great. He's crazy. Um, and Simone Luciani. Um, and I think why I was so excited was uh, these two are, are to me kind of at the top uh, of their kind of respective games when it comes to uh, building games. And I feel like this year, especially like, Turks is always uh, got his name on something. Um, and I feel like each year there's four or five games. Luciani, I think also had maybe five games that were yeah. set to hit this year. Um, when you look at these games, that's kind of mind blowing. So another one where kind of like David Thompson, I'm not sure if Simone Luciani is sleeping well or not, but I doubt it. Right. Cause <laughs> he's just, he seems to always be, be working on pretty heavy stuff. Board and Dice, um, one of my favorite publishers. And I joke with their team a lot because the games, they always feature exactly what they say they will, right? There's always a board, usually some dice. But there's no <laughs> dice in a couple of the games that have come out lately. My number one game from last year was to let them. Mm, um, so good. And I think what was interesting to me about that was it didn't make a lot of other people's number one, but everyone thought, eh, this is pretty good. But when I played it and I read that rule book, exceptionally well-written rule book, is it felt like a classic 
the first time I played it. And I thought, this is the pretty much the perfect midweight kind of game for me last year. Yeah, the guys, uh, the Game Brain guys loved it. Yeah, like I've, not, I think a couple of them had it for their number one. So to let him to me, uh, this is one of those like kind of gatekeeper. Oh, oh, you didn't like to let him? Then I kind of turn around and walk out of the room. Like, <laughs> oh, but no problem. That's fine. Um, so, so with Nucleum, I was excited, right, because of the design pedigree. Um, and the biggest mistake I think people have made so far is that they keep trying to compare it to Barrage and Brass. Like Nucleum is just Nucleum. It's just it's just it's a different game. Um, and I think that game is is pretty good. I don't know if this was the the as good I, I was really hyped for this and i think it was just really good mm-hmm. um so still an endorsement but um great i think grand Austria hotel is the best hero ever made so so i start from places like that as okay accessibility great decision making the let's waltz expansions are quite good i think nucleum is just a really really solid city building adventure um a lot of edge case rules, so so a little bit like Zhang Guo. This is one of those games that you're probably going to have to think hard about. I, I I use a game called Feudum in this example quite a bit. I think Feudum oh, I is also Feudum. kind of yeah. If you play Feudum, you know Feudum. And Feudum <laughs> is in the category of if you play Feudum one time, you've made a terrible mistake because you've invested way too much time, and and now you don't have to keep playing it or just walk away. Nucleum gave me that sense as we went through the, some of the teach the first time. So I've played Nucleum now four times, twice solo, um, and twice at three player. Um, and I, I think it's really solid. I think that, um, the, the hook for me with this game is how the action selection system works. You've got a certain series of these small tiles and each player is assigned a handful of them to begin each game based on the technology board that they have in front of them. So you've got some of these little tiles and each tile, it's not double-sided, it's double-ended. So there's an action on one end of the top and then the other end of the top has a different action to do. Um, But the backside of each tile is a train track. And your job is to figure out with these tiles, do I use it for its actions, both of them, or do I flip it over and essentially murder off one of my workers to sit on this piece of track to help build out a network of track that connects various cities and locations that have nucleums, which in the game's made up history are where energy can be sourced to power the rails that move things around in this, in this place. That is, I think meant to be like Saxony or a version of Europe from like 150 years ago, but, but of course, whatever. <laughs> so, so, um, so, the tension that comes from those choices is quite interesting. Um, I really love that action selection in part because when you play those tiles into your player board, you have to play a certain number of them in order to move far enough down your income tracks so that when you take a recall action, you can generate enough points or workers or, or cash basically to do things. Money's pretty tight in Nucleum. Um, it's not, it's not crazy tight. It's not pipeline. I feel like pipeline each time I play it. I'm like, I, I, I seem to have no, it's turn two <laughs> and I'm taking loans again. What's happening? I don't think it's yep. that tight, but it's tight. Um, and the technology boards give you the juicy bonuses that you look for in a Luciani and a, and a Turksy design. It's, 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 it's got those kind of standard Euro E things. Um, and I think the end game condition is also what I love because. It, it's it's each time I've played it, it's kind of snuck up on me. Like, okay, you know the five ways that the game could trigger uh, one of the bonuses or one of the conditions. And when two or three of them have been triggered, the game is basically just over. And so even when you're, when you're monitoring other players, it's, it's sometimes it just – a classic example of you want to do a lot more, you don't have enough time, which things can I do to efficiently move through this puzzle? Um, I, I think this one, and I've heard, I've heard this commentary already from others, right? I think, I think it's, it's not as beautiful looking a production as like a Zhang Guo, for example. I, I love the way that one plays in terms of look and feel and table presence. This one doesn't have quite that level of table presence, but it's still, it's still really, really good. Um, 
the big surprise with, with Nucleum was how short it was. Um, my plays, my multiplayer plays were two hours and seven minutes and two hours and 12 minutes. Wow. So for three players, to me, that's a sweet spot. In fact, when I read the rules, I was frightened by the idea of a four player Nucleum. I was like, I don't think so. No, I think I want to do it. So I kind of leaned out of that space and, and the board kind of scales to the number of players you have. Um, a note also about the solo design, because I think some of David's solo designs are famously like, you need a degree to read the rule book <laughs> for the solo, right? This one was more accessible than I was expecting. And as a game, it's not quite as heavy in terms of the actions, but I do think you'll play with some players that on turn three or four are like, I blew it. My game's over. I can't do this, man. I, I, mm. I, I didn't plan well enough to do all the things I want to do. Some of that's valid, right? So I think the weight you might see in BGG is tied mainly to that. Like very strategic. You, you got to think on turn one, if I build somewhere, I can still start a new network elsewhere without the same constraints as games like what people have mentioned, like Barrage or, or Brass. But- it's going to be hard to dig out of a hole against an experienced player. Um, but very solid. I, I think, I think board and dice continues to, to churn out just, I think very, very strong. I mean, I liked even origins first builders. I, I, I thought that was pretty good too. Didn't get a lot of love, but I thought it was pretty good. Um, if you like your euros to be thinky and the interaction to come from strategic actions on the board, uh, and not from funny, okay, I got this cool thing on my board and you don't. And so therefore I'm going to sneak in and do this thing. Everyone's got those cool sneaky things on their board. So, <laughs> um, I thought it was really good. Cool. Yeah. So I have, I have, I played Nucleum only once and it was earlier this year and David Turtsy taught it to the group, the four player group that I played Love with. It. And, uh, I knew, well, the teach was long. Uh, the setup was long. And, but I knew, uh, and we were slow. Like, that's why I was surprised you were saying like only two hours to play it, you to know, play it. Yeah. Two hours. Because I, our game, I feel like was very slow because mm. we all were just like, whoa, you know, what do we do? <laughs> what do we, you know? Uh, but I enjoyed it a lot. And I knew yes. I was like, this is going to be a huge S and release. Like every, you know, almost every heavy gamer is probably going to like love this game. Yeah. And, you know, I totally agree with, you were people sometimes will go too hardcore of comparing it to like brass and barrage. Uh, but it was funny. Cause like when David taught it to me uh, and our group that I played with, uh, he was, he was like, he's like, yeah, you know how you do this in brass? It's the opposite here. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> like, You know how this works in barrage? It's the opposite. So he was kind of, you know, compare anti comparing things to uh, those two games. And I think um, that's where a little bit of that, um, probably got into people's heads of doing that comparison. And obviously you're laying tracks and doing, you know, right. there, there are all sorts of reasons, but yeah, you can't get too caught up with that comparison to like, just try to appreciate the game for what it is and understand that it, it is a different, it is a different beast, but different beast. Um, yeah. So anyway, I just, I have not played it post Essen. Um, I enjoyed it quite a bit and I'm, I know I'm going to like love it. I just haven't, gotten that one you know fresh to the table um and i also like i'll be frank like i was intimidated by the setup and the teach i'm like it's, uh, like i'm I feel kind like the guys of dreading are, are so very wrong always say this too right it's it's not nothing yeah it's a it's a so on step 17 draw a setup <laughs> card and then place these three tiles on exactly these Two cities, and 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 then you're like, man, this took 25 minutes again. So <laughs> you, you you almost want to have an intern or a task rabbit, right? That's right. like, hey man, I'm going to pay you ten dollars. You set up my game for me, and then I'm going to walk into the game room to yeah. play it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I I yeah, I just knew like when after learning it and helping set it up and everything and tearing it down, I'm like, this is going to be something I'm so looking forward to playing with people who know how to play it, so we could just like kind of all jump in and and, and get started. Uh, but the people that of uh, two of the people that I played my first game with, well, first and only game uh, with played it the next day and they were like, it was Genius. so much smoother yes. because just having that first play, it's a heavy Euro game, you know? So that makes mm -hmm. sense. But like after 
they like we all enjoyed it like the first play, but like they were just saying how much smoother it was that second game. So um, I look forward to kind of uh, getting back there with that one. I know a lot of people, uh, people I play with locally have been playing it um, a lot and, you know, enjoying it. So Mm -hmm. that's cool. That's Nucleum. So what's your number three? My number three is a game that has a little backstory, uh, not like huge, but back in like three years ago, I mentioned this game in BGG News, like just as I was starting to kind of like cover more historical board games. And I would, you know, I'll find games like either I think I was on GMT's newsletter or something. And I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting. I'm going to tell people about this. It seems different. Uh, The game is called Border Reavers. And the the (laughs) official title is Border Reavers, Anglo-Scottish Border Raids 1513 to 1603. GMT. GMT Games. And it's designed by... (laughs) It's not that long. It had to be GMT. That's that's good. I think there was another game, an older game called Border Reavers. So uh, they put the whole, you know, colon to give people a little more context of what it's about. But uh, it came out this year. But as I said, I, I... I learned of it like three years ago and I, I pre-ordered it through their P500 pre-order. Okay. And I think it was like one of the first games I ever P500 pre-ordered because I was like, this sounds neat, you know? Mm, look and at you now. <laughs> I know, right? It's deep in the P500. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a P600er now. <laughs> um, but this is designed by Ed Beach. Um, and I don't know, like unless you're f- familiar with GMT games and play mm. like historical strategy games and war games, Ed Beach designed Here I Stand, which I've talked about on the podcast, and Mm -hmm. Virgin Queen. These are like what I call like historical TI4 games. Like these are like all day games with asymmetric uh, factions that are just like really exciting with the right group for the right people. But um, that is like those are his two uh, biggest games. And uh, this one is a little different. It plays with one of six players. I played a full player count game. So we played a six player game. Uh, I was really excited to learn this because when I was at GMT's warehouse a couple weeks ago, I feel like I saw multiple people like about to play it and then nobody played it. And I've just been curious about it because it like seems so different. So, um, yeah, so the the game is set basically in the midst of the raids and battles um, that happened between the border of England and Scotland during the 16th century. And in the game, each player represents... A, a like one of the major families that were trying to protect its borders and become the most notorious border reaver. And you want the most victory points at the end of the game, pretty much. There but um, border reavers were just like, is the name of these diff- these people who were raiding along this border in this time period. And the game board is divided into what were like these territories that were called marches. So there's like an East Scotland march. There's a Central Scotland March. I might not be saying it right, but you'll get the idea. They were in the middle. And then there's a uh, West Scotland March. And then there were also the same side on the other side of the board for the English side, um, West, e- uh, West Central East. Um, okay. So, and that represents if you play a full six player game, you're each going to be a family that's like, you're trying to protect your March pretty much. Hmm. Everybody starts with sheep on the board. So this is a, Very unique uh, historical, like war related game that has sheep and like livestock. Livestock is a big part of it because that was a huge part of these raids. Like you were trying to take other people's sheep and cattle and cows and everything. Uh, Sorry, sheep and horses and cattle. (laughs) Um, So that's one of the things that will score you points at the end of the game is by having. Like every pair of horses you have is worth three points. Every pair of sheep you have is worth two points. Every pair of cattle are worth one point. And in this game, cattle are also your currency. So when you're playing cards, uh, the cost is usually you have to pay a certain amount of cattle. Um, And then the horses you're going to use to like add to your dice rolls for raids and all sorts of things. But Mm -hmm. you start the game with a cube in the um, the march that's across from you. So I, I was on the Scottish side, so I had a cube in a feud box, meaning um, uh, that I have a feud with the English side in this particular march. They have a cube in, in my box, in the feud box. And then we also 
have this, like you have this jailbreak area. So you have this jail where we have a cube. So each of us has like these cubes on each other sides that kind of start the game. And there are ways that other cubes can get in there depending on things that happen. But it's split into three years. So it's three game rounds. And each round is broken into four seasons. And another unique thing about this game compared to, you know, a lot of games you might find in GMT's catalog is you're going to start the uh, round with a draft. So Mm. in summer, there's a draft and you're drafting these cards, which this is one of the things I'm so excited about playing this game again for, because now having after having played it once, I'm like, Oh, let's go. Like, I want to, like, just... Yeah, right, right. right. But you're drafting cards that are either going to go into your tableau to kind of give you special abilities. Um, There are certain slots for a particular type of cards, like you can have a warden, and then you can have, like, officers and other uh, things known as grains, G-R-A-Y-N-E-S, which are, like, these, like, more minor families that were kind of supporting you. So you're drafting cards that are going to, like, kind of go into your tableau to give you some special abilities. You Some of the cards are one-time effect, like, hey, get some more sheep or get some more horses or, you know. And then there are other cards that you can hold, So you'll kind of, which gives a little intrigue. So you can hold them face down. And when you want to, you know, when it makes sense, you play them. So you draft, take a card, pay for it, draft, take a card. So everybody gets cards in summer. Then when autumn comes around, you pick three random event cards and, um, and everybody gets to place defense tokens. So you have little squares on the, on the map where you can, you start with some defense tokens, but again, through these cards you get from the draft, you might get more and they might help with if somebody tries to raid you. So you get to kind of pick where you're placing defense. Like, hey, if I have a lot of sheep here and I think somebody's going to try to raid me, um, I might put my stronger defense tokens, but they're all placed face down. So we're all doing this simultaneously. And they don't get flipped until somebody actually comes and tries to raid you. Uh, then it's like, ha ha, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> there's also a thing in the game with like some of these cards where you can flip your sheep face down, meaning you're like kind of putting them in bastels, um, that are like these like protective kind of forts. Oh, I see. So, okay. so, so basically if your sheep are flipped down, no one can raid you. No one can take those sheep from you. Um, hmm. Dot Why would asterisk, you, so I guess, asterisk okay, yeah. though, because there are a few cards that let you go somewhere and flip their sheep up so you can potentially take them. Bingo. <laughs> but mm-hmm. but you are trying to protect them because they're scoring you points. So like a part of this game is you're trying to get sheep and yeah, which is like mm-hmm. very, very different for a non Uva Rosenberg game. <laughs> 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 like how many we were talking like like sheep meeples like yes sheeples? they're sheep that- they're sheeples sheep okay. meeples and they're Gotta a horse sheeples. and they're also horse meeples the cattle are just like tokens they're little uh cardboard tokens that have a picture of cattle yeah, okay currency um but then when you get to when you get to the winter phase oh i should also say the event cards that go out like some of them are going to be like battle cards that go on certain areas of the board And what's different about this is initially when we put a battle card, like the first round, a battle card went in my neighborhood and I'm like, oh, shoot. So people are going to come here and battle me. But it's Mm -hmm. not that they're battling me. You're like multiple players, one from the English side and one from the Scottish side can battle the card, essentially, because it like was representing like things were taking place here. But it's not like a a personal attack on me, but it just Mm -hmm. kind of varies up. um yeah, so one, so some of the event cards might be battles in certain locations. Some might be other effects. Like, hey, put a certain amount of tokens on here. Uh, people can reroll if they're doing X, Y, Z, like jailbreaks in here, or like you know, just game, like uh, turn round changing effects. Mm-hmm. You know, L- typical little spice. event stuff. Yeah, little spice. Little spice. So then the mm-hmm. real meat and potatoes is when you get to the winter phase. So in the winter phase, everybody has these six target cards, like. Um, that we, you only get six the whole game and when you, you're going to play two each round and once they're played, they're gone. So mm-hmm. you think about the order you're playing them, but each card has, um, s- multiple options. So you're not like stuck, but we are each going to pick, um, put one card out face down. 
Mm-hmm. Once we've all done that, we flip them all over. <laughs> and the turn order is very important. On the first round, it's just random. Um, but then you go in order and you have to put out like a token of like, what am I doing this round? Like, I'm going to try to break out my family member from Justin's march. So I'm targeting, you know, you put your little token saying, this is what I'm like targeting. You don't resolve it yet. Um, And then uh, also, or I'm raiding Justin's area or whatever. So I put a token there. And so everybody does that. And then um, you're not actually, yeah, you're, you're putting the card out. You're not doing anything else. Then on every march, there's a notoriety track. So a big okay. part of this game is you want to be the most famous, like the no- most notorious border reaver. So you are trying to work up on these tracks and get uh, have notoriety in each of these different areas. Every round, there's going to be scoring based on who's furthest ahead on all of these notoriety tracks. So that's part of the game, too, and a way that you're getting points. And each year, the points are increasingly better. Like I think in the first year, the highest on the track maybe gets three points. By the last year, you get nine points. And second place is only three points. And if you're tied for first, you only get three points. Uh, It's devastating. (laughs) It happened to me. (laughs) Devastating. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so there are cards that are going to let you increase your notoriety in different areas. And this is all stuff that you got from the draft. And and then you kind of like resolve all these like raids and battles. You are rolling dice, but the amount of dice that, which, oh, dice, run away. <laughs> I'll uh, give you a dice, but yeah. some people are like, what, dice? Yeah, but the, the cool thing about this game is that you are in control of the amount of dice you roll. There are things that you can do to get re-rolls and modifiers, and this is all like some of those cards you're drafting. Sometimes it's an event effect, but like you, when you place your uh, token saying like what your intentions are for the round, you're also going to be able to place a certain number of horses. And horses are going to give you more dice to roll. Horses. Yeah. The different cards in your tableau might give you more dice to roll for like, depending on what you're doing. So Mm -hmm. you're like, you get a pool of dice and you roll them and like fives or sixes are like successes. And, um, it's cool. It's, 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 it's pretty cool. And then, um, when you, your horses come back, they're, they're sleepy because you do two (laughs) rounds of this where you play that target card, go through and kind of like, quote unquote, attack each other. Um, mm-hmm. You do two rounds of it and your horses don't refresh till the end of the round. So if I allocate four horses for this raid, I only have two left to do whatever the second thing I'm doing oh, okay. on my second mm-hmm. card. And then in during spring, you kind of do some cleanup. You score victory points for notoriety tracks and um, other stuff. But it it's really, really unique. It's like- yeah. This I, theme is for sure. I don't think I know a game where- the theme, the theme, the history, the historical tie-in to the gameplay uh, was really cool. Our scores were 105 was the lowest and the highest was 129. And okay. most of us were in like five points. So okay. it was it was a really tight game. Everybody, I love how the the cards that you're drafting and placing in your tableau give you kind of your, makes your family more asymmetric. Mm. Um, the... Yeah, the, I I don't I don't even know how to describe it. Like some of the <laughs> the struggles, like the the things you're doing, and like the choices you're making on like who you might want to raid or when you might want to try to jail get get uh, like jailbreak one of your family members somewhere. Um, you know, trying to boost on these notoriety tracks. It just it felt like different, but I really really enjoyed it and. I realized how much I enjoyed it when later that night I was I shared a hotel room with Lauren and I was just like thinking about it and Is I this just, the, what, the same Lauren that that sold you down the river uh, in the uh, the, the other the communist game. Lauren uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah same Lauren <laughs> yeah partner in fascism that yeah. same Lauren okay <laughs> exactly exactly but yeah like the 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 card draft has like really interesting choices and there are lots of different ways you can get points throughout the game. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I just love like the winter phase, like when it's popping off, it's 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 really exciting. And, you know, you'll see depending on turn order, like you can see what somebody else does or what they're targeting. It might change what you want, might want to do. Um, I will say I got burned on turn order the last the last round. Oh, man, because I was mm. 
I think by like the second year, I was in first place on victory points. So Mm -hmm. turn order is then in reverse Reverse. order. So me being late to do some things, I was kind of getting some of my choices were getting cut off. Like I wasn't able to join battles, which like help you get victory points. So, uh, but I learned from that. And it's like in a game like Twilight Imperium, where if you get too far ahead, everybody targets you. I feel like this, like I want to be a little more modest about how I score in relation to people so I can control that turn order a little bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, it's a very, very unique game. And I'm already like, uh, I'm already making plans to play it again at BGG Con in a couple of weeks. I want to try it with four also and see how that feels. Our game took four hours, four hours. I think I say um, six hours. I was like six. I was hours. about to what? by accident. No, no, no. It it was four hours with five new people, and the guy who taught had play tested the game. He did a okay. phenomenal teach. Um, but That's clutch. I will say, like, I think it could get down to three hours with six people if everyone has at least played the game once, because there are a lot of things you can do. Kind of like even if you're in the middle of doing a raid, other people can get prepared to figure out how many dice they're going to roll for whatever they're doing. Um, mm-hmm. Cause they have all these, these little tokens that let you figure out how many dice you're going to roll. So there are things that like can really speed it up. And we were just also, we were learning. So we're like looking at cards really long. Like, what does this mean? You know, but I think, I think it could get down to like three hours for a six player game. So Whew. yeah. So it's I'm impressive. really excited to play it more that that's border reavers. So yeah, I presume you've never heard of this. I haven't, but I mean, you've that overview was fantastic, and I think it just again thematically, I'm confident I've never played a game in the 1500s in <laughs> in, in that area of the world. Like 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 so sometimes that that helps sell what's there. Yeah. Also, as you were talking, uh, the family element. You know, I, I I love the game Obsession for that same reason. Like, there's just some fun elements that come yeah. with the family dynamics, and yeah. You have me intrigued by what is included with with this game uh, in that way. So yeah, if we're yeah. if we're at a convention or something together, we we should we should definitely play it. And yeah, we were we were leaning into like our family names and everything. There it is, right, right, right. and right. and yeah, <laughs> the people and like who our warden was and all that. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. But yeah, I thought it was a, a really neat game, and I'm, you know, again, I kept thinking about it, and I, I want to play it more. And it's, it's on the brain. Yeah, it's know? all, it is on the brain. All right, we got <laughs> two more games. Two more games. Number two, two, two. two so two. my number two. Um, we, we talked already about Simone Luciani. Let's, let's just keep that train rolling. Uh, Rats of Wistar is oh. my number two. Um, a game that is published by Cranio Creations um, in other parts of the world. It'll, it'll be released from Capstone Games here in the U.S. Uh, sometime, I think, early next year. Uh, but I picked up a copy from the kind uh, people over at uh, at Cranio. I will say too, I, yeah, it seems like every time you, you you like take a left hand turn out of your house, you run into another designer or another publisher. <laughs> it seems like everywhere you go, yeah, you know, I just happened to run into so and so. Right. I don't really run into designers here in Chicago, um, but at the show in Germany during our meeting with Cranio, um, uh, Simone Luciani came over and was talking to us for a few minutes about the wow, game. Wow, cool! The things coming out, and I don't get starstruck very easily, but I had to admit, I was like. This guy's he's he's on a tear right now. So <laughs> I didn't get so pictures cool. or anything you know, silly, but I was like, "Hey, man, just you're having a great year. Keep up great work, all that." Um, After you wipe the drool, that's right, that's right. <laughs> yeah, and the tears uh, away because he also had to wear. I think as part of the promotion for Nucleum, they had him like in a costume similar to the outfits you see on the cover of, of that game too. So he was, I think, enjoying not being in costume on the day nice. that I caught him. So nice. Just a funny moment. Um, I, I hear that I say about Rats of Wistar because I, I think that why I'm so happy with this one is that I didn't have a great first play. Sometimes when you try a game and that first play isn't great, you're thinking, this game's probably just okay. I, I always play, when I review a game, I always play it usually th- somewhere between three and five times. Like I've played Hegemony five times, but in part, I wanted to play it at least once with each of the factions. Makes sense. With some games, yeah. you're like, all right, I think I had the general sense of what's going to happen here, but let me play it some more. So I played it at three, 
actually at Beth's house. Um, and I thought, yeah, yeah, I made that sound, right? (laughs) Uh, and then I played it solo twice and then I played it at four. And by the time I finished the four player game, I was like, this is pretty good. Mm. Um, now I think what, what worked for me and that I was surprised worked for other people at the table for the four player game is that there's a, there's a wheel. So, you know, barrage lovers, some, some of his other designs, right. Have like a central mechanic. It's not a rondelle, but there's just a, an action selection wheel. Sure, sure. And that scales up or down to the number of players. And it's tight. And so when you want to choose one of the game's six actions, you're, you're basically playing a rat family leader who's leading their group of rats back <laughs> into the Wistar Institute to, I think, basically prove which of the rat factions should lead all of the rats Okay. <laughs> in this game's world. Gotcha. Um, and I want to say it was Virginio Gili who designed, who co-designed First Rat. And First Rat was great. And Rats of Wistar is coming too close for me to believe that they didn't collude on this one. And they were like, <laughs> we got to have more rat games. And so, so they're part of the Italian masters to me. But I was like, which rat game is going to be better? I, I think while First Rat is very good, I think this is a little bit better. There's a lot of things that work for me. The action selection wheel is really interesting and super tight. And the way it works, you've got three like rat chieftains that are your workers. And on a turn, you'll place one of these rats in one of the open spaces on the, on the wheel. And the power of that action is driven by the number of rat workers, which look suspiciously like some of the meeples from the game root. In fact, everyone that sees it usually is like, did they just borrow those pieces? Did they just say they're so good? And so um, you've got a bunch of rat workers and you have to be strategic in where you're going to move those workers to trigger the power of where you've put your rat chieftain because a rat chieftain in a region that has no rat workers of their own player color doesn't generate any strength. So you can't take Mm. any actions at that point. Okay. You'll, you'll get the bonuses from the wheel, but nothing else. So the wheel, which moves 60 degrees, it's, it's, there's six sections. And so it moves 60 degrees each round, um, dictates which of the six actions you can take, like building beds and digging out holes in your, in your rat network typical or, or rat ex- stuff. Yep. Rat stuff. <laughs> typical rat action. Exploring the Wistar Institute, which is um, represented by an area that looks like a, basically a house called the farm. Um, and then within that, each rat chieftain space triggers some kind of, of bonus action that you can do before or after your main action. So this one, a little bit like Toledum, which I mentioned earlier, has that, that, that nice sweet taste of, oh, I want me, I want those combos, baby. I want those combos. Give those combos. I need that drip. <laughs> so you got a little bit of that. Um, but some players like the idea of exploring the house, which is the exploration action. Mm. Some people want to, want to score most of their points through an action that allows you to take cards from a, a face up market of cards. And there's like 180 unique cards, like all silly stuff, oh, wow. like kind of funny rat inventions. Cause these rats, which ex- escaped from the Wistar Institute, uh, apparently are all now rat geniuses. And so they can, you know, they have cool little things. But whatever. <laughs> That's cool. But, but the cards are fun and they do little things, ongoing powers, uh, beginning of round income, uh, end game scoring, uh, instant bonuses, all, all the things you would expect, um, with these games. Um, and it's just a, a very, um, pleasant experience tied to a tight action selection frame. Um, you got a player board where you are like, building these beds and you're trying to find ways to build those beds in empty spaces in your rat community. Yeah. Yeah. Which unlocks more workers for you to strengthen the actions you take on the main board. So I approached it and I do this with most of my review plays in one of my games. I said, I'm going to run to the, the basement of that house and grab the piece of cheese to try and get a bunch of juicy and game scoring points in one game. I intentionally didn't go into the house. I just said, I'm going to go ahead and build a bunch of cards, build up a tableau and get cool actions from that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you try different things and, and I was surprised that each one of them felt interesting, uh, which cool. isn't always the case. Um, lo- love the card system. 
um, and it plays relatively fast. I think I like it at all player counts, which is not usual for me. I usually like games that are best at the at the highest player count. But solo was fun. The three player was was interesting, but that was my first play that wasn't great. The four player really really shined nicely for me. Um, so Rats of Wistar, I, I think that um, like all these games, right? There'll be expansion content that probably has another hundred cards or something crazy. They'll add a fifth player, whatever. I, I just think that. Um, the heart of that action selection wheel is why I keep coming back to it. So that's, I really enjoyed it. That's cool. Like I have, I have not, uh, I didn't pick up rats of Wistar. I'd be curious to try it at some point, but it is, uh, and I was curious to hear your thoughts on it. Cause I did talk to Beth after that first play and she was saying, yeah, we were all kind of like, just okay meh. on it. Meh, meh, meh. But it's, it's great to hear that, you know, after exploring it a little more, trying it at different player counts, you're like, Oh, no, there's there's something really cool here. You know, I think Rats of Wistar 2 is one of those games, actually like a lot of games lately. You know, I, I, I'm in five different gaming groups here in Chicago, and a lo- most of my friends that play games, you know, they play a game once. Right. You know, maybe twice. I'm, in fact, I'm really fortunate to be in this role with Meeple Mountain and, and the podcast that I do with with the Five By. Um, big shout out to Ruel, by the way, is, is that um, – I'm kind of forced into playing the games more. And so I have a couple of groups that are like, I know you're trying to explore this thing. You want to see different player counts. That's awesome. You want to explore yeah. different. So, so I get the chance to play a game probably more than I would if I just said, I'm going to buy it once. Cause I'm afraid if I played it once and it was just a copy I bought, I would have walked away after mm, one, one play. Yeah. So I think it got there, but only through the fourth play. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's, go. that's cool. And yeah, I, I agree too. You know, while I I don't review games um, in BGG News, like with my writing, I'm doing more mm-hmm. so like just overviews of telling people this is how it works. But I yeah. still like to play it like a few times because, you know, especially like the heavier a game is, not even just heavy games, like light games, like you discover so many things from just trying them multiple times. You understand them more to kind of like talk about them mm-hmm. um, and give people a better sense for how it feels to play. So um, that is cool. And that is something I definitely appreciate about what we do is, you know, it's like it's it helps us to play it more. So we do play it more. But yes, there are sometimes games where you just play it once and eh, you move on. But it's like maybe if you did that second play, it'd be like, oh, you know, it could have been Mm -hmm. like a real gem. You brought up root meeples for a second, so uh, I did. my next. What's your number two? My number two game is Arcs. So uh, there we go. Yeah, Cole had um, Cole Worley. This is a ga- new game coming from Cole Worley and Leader Games, and coming out next year. He was on the show. Right? Uh, yes, he was. He was uh, episode seven, maybe. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Cole's designs, but you know, in this world where we have so many games coming out all the time, I have not been really keeping up with arcs. I'm like, I knew I was going to play it at some point when it comes out. And, but I have, I never played it on TTS or any of the early versions or anything. But when I saw he had it on the table at the show, I was like, okay, I got to play arcs while I'm here. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. So I got to play arcs with uh, Dan Thoreau, who's uh, most people know as Space Biff, who writes mm-hmm. like um, amazing game reviews. Um, also, Josh Starr played with me, uh, Grand okay. Trunk Games. Yeah, uh, they yeah. just did uh, 18XX guy. Just did, yep, 18XX guy just did the latest uh, 1889 Shikoku oh, uh, reprint. Beautiful. Looks so beautiful. beautiful. It's probably the most mm-hmm. beautiful looking 18XX yeah. game. Yeah. And also, uh, the fourth player at the table is Ananda Gupta, who's one of the designers of Twilight Struggle and Imperial man, Struggle. Yeah, a bunch of all stars. I know. That's man. why I had to mention. That's why I had to mention. <laughs> at some point, Ananda had to head, head out. So uh, Drew, Cole's brother, Drew Worley, took over his spot. But um, I, for the listeners out there, I feel like I, I mean, I, I double or triple dare someone to find a, like someone that has a better role in our space right now than you. I mean, I mean <laughs> what's going on here? You're just I, crazy. I'm very fortunate and sometimes end up at the right place at the right table at the right time. Yes, you um, do. But uh, yeah, so ARCs, for anyone who's not familiar, is this space opera game. That can be played in less than two hours. Like I think they have the box time of like sixty to ninety minutes or something like that. Okay. Um, 
but I would just say under two hours, which is cool because a lot of like, you know, big space opera type games usually take all day or several hours to play. Um, so that's kind of was the initial hook of it. Um, in the game, each player plays a different faction and you could play. It's also um, there's a whole campaign mode for the game, but we just played kind of a one off game. And um, so a single game can be played in up to five chapters or rounds. Mm -hmm. So it's going to end at a max of five rounds. Whoever has the most victory points wins. But it can end sooner if someone hits a VP target. So it varies by player count. I think in a four-player game, if someone hits 27, um, game over. Uh, But this game is kind of neat because it uses this this kind of like trick-taking... Like this trick taking trick taking action so I mean. selection system. Yeah. It, it's it's kind of cool. So basically the player, whoever has the initiative, will lead with the card. Well, first of all, you have a deck of cards that are all like suits and um they're different action cards. So they're not really suits, but each card has uh what are they like four of them? I think they're four different suits, but each suit has like multiple actions like you could do this or this with this suit or you can do maybe three things with certain suits um so one player is going to lead with a card and then the other players when it comes around the table to them they have a choice they can either surpass copy or pivot um and surpass means you play a higher card of the same suit that the lead player played uh copy means you play a card face down Um, meaning maybe you didn't have a card that was higher of the same suit, or maybe you just wanted to do something different, but you play a card face down and you do one thing on the card of the lead suit. So the Mm. other thing I didn't mention about the cards is they have these like little pips on them, um, that tell you the amount of actions you can take. So maybe there's a card that has, you can, uh, build or repair or something, um, and if it has four pips, you can do four things. You can build four times, repair four times, do two and two, split it however you want. So if I copy, I just do one thing that's on that lead card. If I surpass, I do whatever the amount of pips are, but you have to play a higher card than the lead card. And then if I pivot, I play a card face up that's a different suit. I'm not following. So I can only do one action on the card that I chose to play. So you have a lot of like flexibility with what you can do. And sometimes like it's it'll challenge you a bit because I think my first hand, I had like four cards of one suit, two cards of another suit. So I did not have a good variety of mm, options. Okay. So I often had to pivot or um, or copy. And um, the person who plays the highest card, so everybody will play their card, do their actions, play the card, do the actions. But then um, – After all the cards are on the table, you'll see who played the highest card of the lead suit and they will take the initiative. So they'll start the next trick or the next round. And And each one of those tricks is a chapter or that's a, that's a piece. No, the whole hand of cards is a chapter, the whole hand of cards. So six cards will be the chapter. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So the person who, who has the highest of the lead suit will take the initiative. Also the cards go to seven. So if somebody plays a seven of the lead suit, they will take the initiative and then it's kind of like locked in. But to give people flexibility, if you, you know, you might not have a hand of cards where you have high cards that you can kind of take the initiative, you can always optionally, if nobody else has done it this round and nobody um, played a seven, you can play a second card face down with your card and mm-hmm. you automatically lock in the initiative to give yourself a chance to start. But you're going to be one card short and not able to play that last trick. Or that last hand, you know, that last action. Um, The reason it's great to lead is because one of the things you can do is put this little uh, declare ambitioned token on your card. And that's going to set the value of your card to zero. But it's going to let you put a scoring token on one of these five ambitions. So throughout the game, we're competing for victory points. The way you get victory points is by scoring these five ambitions. So one of them is like have the most of these two types of resources. One of them is like have the most of this particular resource. So there's, I think, three of them that are resource based. One of them is have the most trophies, which is like you battle and you take people's ships 
and they're trophies. So you're competing. So there is some battling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's okay. some battling. Okay. Yeah. There we go. There is there some go. battling. I don't want to surpass <laughs> everything. I want to I I battle something. There, yeah, yeah. There are also ways to take people's um, – these people's meeples as captives. So there's a scoring objective to say if you have the most captives, you know, so there are five oh. ambitions. And if you are leading, you can say, I'm declaring an ambition and you put this tile on your card and whatever ambition icon is on the bottom of the card you're playing. Um, and these match per number. So every two has the same scoring ambition. Every three has uh, the same scoring ambition, like regardless of suit. But now I'm saying, okay, take the next highest scoring token or no the current highest scoring token and put it on this goal maybe i'm saying i want maybe i'm leading everybody in trophies so i want to score trophies mm -hmm. so you put the token there and that means at the end of the round when we score uh you know if that token said five points and three points the person who has the most is going to get five points the person who has the second most gets three points so a uh, so players by leading are declaring what's going to be scored for the round. And the other like cool this. thing which came out in the game is like someone else could come in and declare ambition and put another scoring token on the same ambition. So you total up the points. Um, mm -hmm. But it's like this really interesting thing because, you know, you're trying to time out when to do that, you know, should you have the opportunity when to do it because there are only three scoring tokens. So once they're out, they're out. And hmm. so there's kind of a, a little bit of tension of like, when is somebody going to trigger it? And, you know, but like, right. you don't want to trigger it too soon when you're like tied with something. Like you want to have an advantage on other people when you pick something, because the minute you pick something, everybody's going to be like, oh, now I'm going to try oh. to compete for that. So, yeah. So that's like a, a <laughs> really- Horror has this little bit actually too of like- Oh, yeah. With like the, the patricians. The like- like yeah, go now I gotta that. now I gotta compete for that. That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. Exactly. So it's got that kind of thing. But the other cool thing is this game, like the actions are really simple. It's like you mm -hmm. can move, you can build ships and their little tri uh, triangle tokens that are buildings you can put on spaces where you have control. Um, you can repair ships. Combat is super simple because it's only the active player who does something. You have three mm -hmm. different types of dice. And you can choose your however, uh, you know, whichever pool, however, how do I say this? You can choose the dice, the types of dice you want to play. So sure. if I'm attacking you and I have four ships, by default, I get four dice. I can take two blue ones, two red ones. And each, each type of dice has its own, like, advantages or disadvantages. Like, mm -hmm. blue are the most basic. They have, I think it's just a uh, coin toss, so it's 50-50 a single hit on three sides, blanks on three sides. Um, the red dice are like assault dice. So they they have some sides that have double hits, but they'll have this okay. flame icon on them, which means you also hit yourself. Uh, then the, the orange dice, you can like raid other people. There are these keys and you'll have these keys on your boards and like different cards you have. So you could possibly raid someone. Uh, <laughs> but it's really simple. Like me, as the active player who's battling, I roll the dice. I resolve it. If I give you three hits, I decide if I damage, you know, three of your ships or if I kill one and damage the other, and then I take it as a trophy. Um, so it's really, really simple. You can uh, tax cities where you're in control of the space to gain resources. Look at this game. I know. Tax and cities. What? <laughs> um, another really cool thing is you have a market of four cards. There are two different types of cards. You have these guild cards and box cards. Box are like these one-time effects. Very powerful, cool stuff. And then guild cards are something you're going to add to your tableau that'll probably give you some kind of like cool ability as the game goes on. And the guild cards have a little resource icon, which contributes if you're scoring majority for a certain type of resource at the end of the round, that counts as one that you have. And they are also resource tokens. But to get cards, you have to take the influence action and put your little meeple dudes out on these cards. And you're like bidding for the card, but it's a two-step process to get a card because you have to influence by putting a, you know a number of meeples on them like maybe if i do three influence actions i put two on one card i put one on another card yeah other people can then influence if they want and <laughs> and put meeples on cards but when you have a majority of your meeples then you could take the secure action and take the card and any opponent meeples that are on there you take as captives 
So that's that is um, one of the main okay. ways that you're getting captives, which is another thing that could potentially be scoring who has the most captives. Um, mm. So I thought that was really, really neat. And like all the cards are super cool. We played a mode where we had these like faction cards like I was a rebel. So I always rolled plus two dice, two battle. We got dice. player powers. We got player. Powers. We got player powers. Player Justin, powers. we got player powers. Pump the fist. Baby. Yes. And then we had another card that was another special ability. So that's like stuff they probably in the rule book will say, like, don't use this for your first game. Right. But but Cole was like looking at the table. He's like, we're using it. <laughs> yeah. Bunch of all-stars. We have put this stuff in the game by now. This is good. Yeah. So yeah. you like so you go through, you play the like six quote unquote tricks, and you do stuff on the board, moving around, battling, collecting resources. Yada, getting cards, yada, yada, yada. Then you score after everybody's played all six cards or everybody has passed. You score uh, based on wherever those ambition tokens ended up. Mm-hmm. And then you shuffle the deck and you rinse and repeat. This, this sounds very sandboxy. Would, would you describe it that way? Like if you played, let me think of, of like a obviously different type of game totally, but like a Western legends where you just, you have a lot of freedom to do a lot of different things. I mean, you have the structure of how the cards yeah. play, but then within that, like you get a lot of freedom on the choice of different actions you could do. It sounds pretty uh, wild. I would not describe this as a sandboxy game be- okay. only because I think you're limited by the cards that in your hand for what you can do and also, depending on who's leading, that impacts, you know, the cards that you can play and how much you can do, how many actions you can do. And mm-hmm. I feel like that and also the whatever ambitions start getting scoring tokens are going to really direct you a bit. So I think, okay. I think you know, I think you're going to be like, as you're playing it, if you start the game fresh – you're going to be thinking about, hey, when can I, oh, like I have one more of these tokens than these people. I want to score that. So now I want to try to declare the ambition so I make sure that scores. But, oh, no, somebody else already declared an ambition. <laughs> now I want to try to go um, maybe battle that person so I can tax them and get that resource. And then so I can at least tie it for some, you know, like I feel like the the scoring conditions for the round, the whichever ambitions have the scoring tokens are going to direct people Hmm. now um you could like kind of play it as a sandbox like oh i'll float around i'll just try to build up you know build on some different areas and everything but i think you have to kind of focus on trying to maximize your scoring and get in on those uh yeah those ambitions when you can so you're gonna be i I feel like that's gonna be like driving a lot of what you do you can definitely have some intrigue about like which one you might be going for um, more so than others. Like, oh, trophies are scoring the most points this round, but right. I am going to ignore trophies and focus hard on the other two so I can try to win the other, t- whatever other two things are scoring, you know? But hmm. I I really liked it. I really yeah. liked it. I was, you know, I just, I couldn't, I mean, I'm not surprised. I, I like, <laughs> I, I like every Cold Whirly game. So I'm, I'm not surprised. I definitely, but I didn't know much about it aside from it had some kind of trick taking yeah. thing and it was like a space game. So um, I had I just had a great time playing it. We only ended up we stopped after the fourth round. Um, there was a chance. I think I made a mistake that there was a chance that I could have ended it early and mm. won. If if two things, if I made a mistake. But also, even if I didn't make that mistake, it wasn't a guaranteed thing. Like it would have come down to. Could I take a resource from Dan? And then if I would have won instead of tying on uh, the, I think it was called Empath uh, Ambition, if I would have won that, I had another city token, which would have given me plus two. I would have gotten to the 27 and I could have done it, but it didn't mm-hmm. happen. And we they had to go to lunch. I We had to go back to LA. So we were like, all right. We'll call it here. <laughs> this time. This time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I told him. I was like, I'm not going to be this nice next time. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was super cool. Uh, so that is ARCs. When does ARCs actually hit the market? I realized that um, – I feel like that and Molly House getting a lot of love in the last week or two um, from, from Cole. When is this one hitting retail? Is it, is it next year? Is it Sometime next year? year. Sometime okay. next year. Um, 
I think uh, they might be still diving in stuff with the campaign mode, but I, I think it's mostly done. I think okay. it's mostly so it's not quite, I, I don't, not don't quite quote done. me on any of this. Yeah. Uh, but I know he was saying like the version of the board that we played on this pre-production copy was a little too dark. So I know like it's it, that wasn't the final version. Um, mm. It looked great though already. Like everything. Kyle Farron's art I assume is in there as well. Of you course. The, the of normal, course. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Oh. It's great. It's great. So, um, and it looks a little different. And of course, the every leader game, uh, every title is exactly four letters. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's the brand. Yeah, exactly. Which is weird because leader is five letters. Shouldn't leader be like L E D R? Right. I mean, they, sh- they need to think about that rebrand. I, I visited their offices because um, Brooke, Brooke Nelson, who you've met, I'm sure, is, is fantastic. But I get to see their lobby, and the lobby has like all whatever, eight, nine, or six different titles, but That's they're all cool. four letters. And just the, the way it's laid out on this very old school, like bulletin board, is, is it's funny. That's um, awesome. Vast, Root, Oath, Arcs, Ahoy. <laughs> Ahoy. Yep. It's great. Mm-hmm. It's great. Um, nice. Yeah, but I'm, I'm definitely excited to um, now get this one. <laughs> so that is Arcs. We got one more. And currently we're sitting at the longest podcast episode. <laughs> we're gonna get our last game in. <laughs> we're gonna get that last game in, though. You know what? I'm gonna make number one quick because it's called Quick Sand, and I will say this: it's my number one because I think that Quick Sand of the games I've talked about, at least on this show, is the game that would fit any human being. Ooh. It's definitely the most accessible game of the ones I've talked about here. Um, Quick Sand, uh, 2023. Horrible Guild, which is the name of the publisher. Um, I got to look and see who the, the, the designer is. But um, another one that came out at Spiel. Uh, and real-time cooperative hourglass flipping is apparently hot. I didn't think this, <laughs> but Kites last year, uh, or maybe earlier this year. It was last year. Floodgate. Yeah, it was, it was okay. last year. Yeah. Yeah, because because we also have skyrockets coming. I saw that. I saw so that. Yeah. I, I joked with with Ian from. I was like, are, are, <laughs> I don't get it, but was there something I missed around why this is so hot right now as a game mechanic? Hey, people, but here we are. We, we love flipping sand timers under pressure. I love it. Right. <laughs> so so a quick sand is is really simple, right? You've got a bunch of tiles that are laid out in like a semicircle, and you've got a hand of cards from a shared deck. Cooperative play with one to seven players and you've got uh multiple timers in the base game there's like there's like 20 scenarios in the box but in the base game there's three sand timers let's go with slow medium medium or slow medium fast or medium medium fast and on your turn you play one of the cards from hand that matches where one of the sand timers is and that allows you to move it forward one space Okay. And every timer that's on a similar tile, which is in one of three colors and one of three different suits, um, you can move every one of those timers forward one space if there's room to move them. When you move a timer, you flip it over. And so the sand is now going in the other direction. Right, right. And you do this until you can move all three or four or five timers from the starting zone into what's known as the danger zone. So cue the top gun music right from the eighties and you're trying to get those timers over. And um, I've not tried it with seven players, but I tried it with one, two, three, four. I played it six times, which is easy to do, right? Cause it's like a 10 minute game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's just a blast. Everyone is yelling. So I love chaos right? <laughs> and everyone is yelling. I thought Kites um, was really good. This is a little bit better because of the list of scenarios that comes in the box. And they gave us a little promo timer at Spiel that's like insanity. Uh, that one, it's, it's super <laughs> short. And so you have to keep that one basically. It's like a teacup. You've got to keep in motion. Oh, my goodness. And um, I, I, I have shown quicksand to the kids, quicksand to strangers, uh, quicksand to gamers. Uh, it is the ultimate dexterity filler because it's not really a dexterity game. You got to reach over and, f- and turn timer over, right? It's it's not like 
shooting marbles or like men at work. We got to balance meeples on like <laughs> balance beams and stuff right, like that. Right, right. So, so you really can't go wrong as a gift to give quicksand to essentially anyone who is able to flip a sand timer. Uh, and my longest play of those six plays was, I think it was nine minutes. So wow. it's just, yeah. it's just one of those games that, um, you probably saw a lot of people playing it at Spiel because it's a, it's a very good, hey, I'm walking around the convention. Let me stop by and just play this I didn't this really see simple. this. Whew. I didn't even know wow. about this. You were probably so it. busy get, signing autographs, right? The rest of us. <laughs> no, the sandwich you know, as a just writer, too quick. <laughs> well, maybe. The beauty of being a writer is no one really knows who I am, right? So for the most part, people don't stop me. Oh, Justin, I, I love your work. Nope, that, that never happened. <laughs> so um, as a result, right, you just – it's easy to learn. We've actually played an entire game during our meeting with with David from from Horrible Guild. Um, it's just I don't know. It's just one of those where I didn't see it coming, and it surprised. And yeah, you said that this one surprised you. It came it came out of left field, and and here we are now. Of course, Skyrockets is sitting here in my uh, in my game area. I need to play that one during the course of November, and I have a feeling I'm gonna like that one too. But but in terms of accessibility, it's gonna be hard to beat this one. So, okay, so that means that like in a year's time, I'm going to do a whole episode on sand timer flip games. For, for quite, <laughs> no, 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 no doubt, right? For sure, we're going to gonna have to do an episode around that. Uh, 10 best sand timer flipping games. Uh, it's, it's super hot. Awesome. Yeah. Quicksand. Yeah, I'll look that one up because, yeah, I'm, I completely missed it. Yep. Uh, so speaking of getting out of here. Number the, one. The number one game. The last game on my list uh, that I just played last night for the very first time is Evacuation. Ooh, and, yeah. And this was My first one, play is later tonight, so I'm excited oh, to hear nice. this Oh, nice. Good, yep, good timing. Yep. Uh, yeah, this is one that I um, was very much looking forward to. I'm a big uh, Vladimir Suhi fan. And uh, this is from Delicious Games. Again, this is a 2023 Essen release, and it plays with one to four players. And the the theme is basically life on our planet is getting burned away by the increasingly intense sunlight. So we have to move people off of our old planet and move on to a new planet. And it has this really cool element to it where you start the game with like a fully functioning economy on your old world. And you're going to need to do stuff like get ships to transport factories over to the new world and build up infrastructure in the new world. Apparently we want stadiums in the new world because that's the thing. <laughs> you have to get through stadiums over there. Right. Um, so this game has two modes you can play, either the race mode or the victory point mode. Uh, I've We played the victory point mode last night. So we played four years and then we scored a bunch of things and you know see who has the most points wins. The race mode, you're racing to get your production level up on the new world to eight for the three different resources, steel, energy, and food. And you need to have uh, three stadiums. And then there are some things that are going to um, determine how that kind of scenario scores, but you're racing to meet that that condition. And um, the board is really cool for this game. It's split into one side on the right side. There's the old world, I plan it. And then on the left side, there's a new world. And in between them, this like S shape kind of thing, um, there's this progress track that's going across the board. Very and cool. um, depending mm -hmm. on how you take your actions, like which slots you take actions on, you're going to be advancing to tokens on this progress bar. And that is basically like in the beginning of the game, you can only build on the tundra terrain on the new world. But as you make progress, you're going to be able to build on a uh, desert and then maybe forest and maybe water if you're really good. But, um, but yeah, you, like I said, you, you're starting, you're trying to get your economy. You're breaking down. Like usually in games, you're building up to, you know, you're yeah. building up to make an economy. You're starting with a full economy. You're tearing it down and you're trying to build it up on the other side. And it's a real fascinating thing. Like I know you like 18xx. So the oh, way yeah. in this game you are managing resources in the old world and then you have resources in the new world. And when you spend resources, like if I spend resources to build a stadium and I'm spending them from my old world, the stadium's going to sit on the old world side of my player board until I have a ship and I fly it on over to the new world. But if I'm still I, trying to embrace the idea that you fly a stadium. 
from one plan to the other. <laughs> I but know. It's a weird know. mechanic. But, it, it, yeah. it is wild. But thankfully, the cards for the stadiums are just those small cards, though. <laughs> it fits on the spaceship. Um, but then, but if I build a stadium spending resources on the new world, it's just built on the new world. So, um, like I said, you're doing different things to build the population on the new world. And you're trying to really just increase your production engine on both sides. You're building stadiums, building infrastructure, building ships so that you're managing the timing of it. Because during the transport phase, you load up ships in your old world. And if you have the energy to pay for them, you fly that ship over. But your new any ones that were on your new world from the previous round now fly back. So there's a whole timing of managing your ships for yeah. transporting things back and forth. Meanwhile, uh, one of the cool things is everybody has, you can research technology and everybody will have a different set of technology tiles and they come out uh, randomly in the row. And it's a kind of game where you have a, a three by three grid of these tiles. And in order to, you always have to start a column from the bottom space, level one, mm-hmm. then you build up to the level two um, or you can, you know, so, you, but the technologies are all really cool. And it was the kind of thing where everybody like was like, oh, your technology is way cooler than mine. And we all felt that way. <laughs> you know, we all felt that way. So um, it's it's really good. It's it's definitely a brain burner. Um, our scores were like the winning score is 46. I came in second with 44. Um, okay. And then another player had 26. Um, we learned that a lot of your points, if you do the victory point mode, um, come from you get these uh, secret scoring objectives, which yes. we will for sure draft next time because uh, oh, we didn't draft it this time. We didn't okay. draft. We were just like, hey, we'll get, we each got four and we ditched one because you'll score. You'll score. Be able to try to oh, score three yeah. of them. Mm-hmm. And uh, but one player ended up with two that synergized really well together. So that won't happen in the future, <laughs> Tim. <laughs> um, You're going to name names here. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. But um, I was really surprised, pleasantly surprised where, again, the, the rules are not that complex. Like, oh, no. spend resources to build a ship. But the, the managing your resources on two different worlds and like the more actions you want to take each round, you have to spend energy. So you really want to try to get an energy engine so that you could take more actions. Um, but yeah, yeah the energy real, seems really important in that game. It is very, but you also need your, food. Yeah. But after your second action, right. It all costs more energy yes. to take more action. Yeah. So you're like, after your second action, third action costs one energy, fourth action costs two energy, oh, fifth yeah. action costs three, six costs three. Yeah. It, mm-hmm. It's, it's a lot. So I, that, you know, and it was like very much a learning game. I think we all will do things a little differently playing a second time. Um, but we we all liked it quite a bit. We played a three player <laughs> game, and uh, I want to try the race mode too because I think in the victory point mode we didn't necessarily, and also because we were new, we didn't necessarily care what each other were doing. But in the race mode, I'm definitely going to be looking to see uh, how many smiley faces do you have? You know, um, how how many stadiums do you have? Oh, you have two already. Oh shoot, mm-hmm. I better keep up. You know, mm-hmm. so uh, I'm looking <laughs> forward to playing this one more and. Uh, yeah, it's 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 really solid. I hope you enjoy it. And I'm looking doing the race to mode tonight. I think uh, the race mode is the one they say you should like. like I'm, I'm a peasant, right? So I always start with what the the rule book says. You start. So yeah. I'm doing that one yeah. tonight. Um, but looking forward to trying it with points mode also. Cool. So that is evacuation, and we will evacuate our ways off of this podcast. <laughs> Justin, it has been great talking to you. Um, you too. And, and I love hearing about these games. You know, some of them that I was like not really on my radar at all uh especially quicksand and uh, the rats game I'm, I'm now i'm curious about the rats game. rats, rats of wisdom no it, the games you you've highlighted here once again i've learned a lot so great conversation great to uh talk through some games yeah love it. yeah well, i'll talk to you soon hopefully love it enjoy Take care. your nuke- thanks again nuclear nuclear play oh yeah thanks oh, for being here <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to the Board Game Geek Podcast, produced and edited by Candace Harris. Special thanks to Matt Fonda for editing and mixing our music. Be sure to visit us on the web at BoardGameGeek.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Twitter, Blue Sky, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitch under Board Game Geek. You can reach us by email at podcast at BoardGameGeek.com. Thanks for listening and happy gaming! Happy gaming!